clearly had some sound issues there. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, can you can can you hear me? Maybe a couple of folks cannot. Okay, thank you. Um, very good. Don't quite know what happened with our wonderful soundtrack of our video, but that was all over. Woo! <laughs> very energizing. We'll figure that out better next time. Um, nice to see everyone uh, here. Thank you for attending the first in our in our series of, of global school events this year. I'm Lori Leshen, I'm the president of WPI, and I'm just really thrilled to welcome you to this conversation. Again, the first of, of many that we'll have this year, but, but a, a particularly timely and essential one. Um, and you're gonna to get to hear a lot more about the topic for today around community climate adaptation, which, you know, figuring out how we as a, as a people on as nations and as communities are going to be responding to this um, major global challenge is really the, the issue of our time as much as it can feel like the pandemic is an issue of our time and other challenges we're dealing with are, this one is, is very clearly front and center. Um, and it's, it's especially uh, close to us here in, in our global school and, and one of the, the first focus areas that we've really brought forward as, um, as a, an area of intensity for our global school, which is still very new on our campus. So uh, at WPI, you know, we are here to transform lives and to turn knowledge into action, to confront the world's challenges and to revolutionize STEM. That's really why we exist, why we do this work. And that's, our, that's the core of our new mission statement as an institution. And, and it really, every single piece of that, whether that's you know, transforming lives is about empowering diverse learners to achieve greater impact and, and revolutionizing STEM is, is about really thinking differently and continuously innovating how STEM interacts with and influences the world. Um, but perhaps the piece of our mission that is, is really near and dear to our hearts and reflected in um, the mission of the global school is that idea of turning knowledge into action to confront global challenges. It's no longer enough for us as a STEM institution to you know, teach our students about important problems. What we need to do is equip learners at WPI and beyond with the skills and abilities to make impact wherever they are on, on problems that are technical and scientific in nature. Yes, certainly that is true for the climate change issue, but like so many problems, it's a bigger challenge than that. There are so many ways that um, the challenge of adapting to climate change is a human problem not only human caused, but, but, the, but the challenge going forward is a very human and community-based challenge. And so the global school at its best is meant to help us unify, integrate, embrace STEM and beyond and bring what's needed, the tools that are needed to help us translate what might be in some cases quite technical knowledges or approaches and infuse those with approaches to dealing with real human beings and real communities to actually move from knowledge to action. So, you know, no pressure, but the global school is our platform to, you know, bring the great thinking. And by the way, there's no shortage of great thinking in the area of climate change as an earth scientist myself, as a former NASA leader myself, you know, overseeing many of the most important uh, measurements and models and thinking that was going on about, about the coming catastrophe in the climate change area. And yet we haven't succeeded in every way we can in translating that knowledge to positive action in the world. And so the global school at WPI is meant to be our contribution to new and different ways of learning and thinking and doing that help us take that knowledge and translate it to action. So um, that's why we're here, and it's and it's a, a skill set that we've honed at WPI over decades of of being committed to turning theory into practice, which is our founding motto: theory to practice. And now it's really about making sure that practice is having maximum impact in the world. So I couldn't be more proud of 
our, uh, our global school team who has embraced this mission with gusto and has, is busy um, creating programs, projects, and experiences for learners to help them build that skill set and build and create um, positive change in the world. So uh, we're here to celebrate that. We're here to discuss it. We're here to challenge ourselves to do it more, do more, better, and faster, um, and and more thoughtfully, and more impactfully, and more inclusively. Very important. Um, so that's that's all that's all we have to try and do today. So um, I want to especially thank our outside speakers that have come in and, and are going to share their wisdom and knowledge with us and their and their ideas and their motivation. And I just want to um, again close by thanking everyone for being a part of this and to urge you to stay with us here, come back next time, and and keep following us and helping us elevate the impact of WPI as we as we. Uh, work on achieving our mission. And with that, I want to hand off to our inaugural Dean of the Global School, Mimi Scheller, who we're so thrilled to having, have joining us at WPI this year um, to really um, embed the Global School in the WPI experience. Dean Scheller, over to you. Thank you, President Leshen, for that great introduction. I am thrilled to open this year's Global School event series with a focus on the most urgent challenge of our times climate adaptation. And since this is WPI, we approach this topic as we do all things with a focus on our mission. Our mission involves community engagement through justice-centered partnerships, equitable teamwork and collaborative leadership with local partners, and co-designing strategies through co-learning. I believe these are the qualities that we will all need to foster if we as societies are going to overcome the vast vulnerabilities that we face because of the climate emergency, and we need to face them together. So um, next slide. And if for those of you who are not as familiar with the Global School, just a really quick overview. We convene research and teaching around the greatest global challenges the world faces today. For all of you students who are here, thank you um, to the audience. You'll be familiar with the ways in which we promote the unique project-based learning model of WPI through our first year Great Problems Seminar, through our ID 2050 course, which prepares students for their interactive qualifying projects, and through our Global Projects Program, which sends thousands of students out into our 50 plus project centers around the world and locally here in Massachusetts. Our new Department of Integrative and Global Studies is a gateway for students and faculty to connect with and make a difference in communities around the world. And in particular today, we're focusing on our Community Climate Adaptation Master's Program, which is a joint program between DIGS and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. CCA offers graduate students training to support communities and organizations as they adapt to the impacts of a changing climate. And our students in this program work within teams to use engineering, social science, and physical and biological science expertise to address challenges of climate change while helping build capacities in communities around the world and learning from community experts. Next slide. We're especially proud to have launched this program and uh, co-directed by Sarah Strauss, who will be with us today uh, with students giving lightning talks. And we try to face the rapid global environmental changes by kind of convening governments, civil society organizations, professionals, and local communities to address the technical, cultural, socioeconomic, and policy issues related to climate adaptation in a comprehensive and collaborative manner. So climate change is an intensifier of existing problems. And that's why we've invited our guest speakers today to come and tell us about the ways in which they're collaborating with communities. Next slide. Today, we're going to have a keynote panel with three special guest speakers. That will be followed by an audience discussion and then a series of lightning talks by students and faculty who are working on these issues around the world and locally. And that will be moderated by Professor Sarah Strauss and then followed by a question and answer at the end. So let me introduce our speakers. 
First, moderating our discussion, next slide, is Doug Parsons. He is the director and host of America Adapts podcast and a partner host at Simpatico Studios. He's a national climate adaptation influencer, and he's a great communicator on these issues. He has interviewed hundreds of people, and he is going to help lead our discussion and help um, broadcast uh, our conversation because Doug is really committed to creating awareness around the emerging topic of climate adaptation. He'll be speaking to our two visiting experts. Next slide. First, I would like to introduce to you Maria Belen Power, who is Associate Executive Director of the community organization Green Roots based in Chelsea, Massachusetts. She oversees Green Roots environmental justice campaigns and supports the work of the organizing team. And she represents the organization in the Green Justice Coalition of the Greater Boston Area. She was recently appointed by President Biden to serve on the newly established White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And she also grew up in a bicultural family in Nicaragua. Thank you, Maria Belen, for joining us. And next, our next speaker in the or panelist in our conversation is Professor Franco Montalto. Franco is a civil engineer and professor of civil and environmental engineering at Drexel University. He is interested in the development of ecologically, economically, and socially sensible solutions to urban environmental pr problems. He also is the founder and president of eDesign Dynamics, LLC, an environmental consulting firm based in New York City, where he also serves uh, in New York as a member of the fourth New York City panel on climate change. And Franco also has incredible regional experience as director of the North American hub of the Urban Climate Change Research Network, where he has been in touch with all the groups working on this issue across our region and across the country and internationally. So thank you so much to Doug Parsons, Maria Bellenpower, and Franco Montalto for joining us today. And I'll now, now hand over to Doug Parsons, who will be moderating our discussion. Thank you. All right, hi there. Thanks, Dean Scheller. Um, again, I'm Doug Parsons. I first off, I just want to thank WPI for inviting me to participate in this, and thanks specifically to Sarah Strauss for the, the invite. I'm very excited to be here, and we're going to have a great panel. I'm going to be moderating, and I'm going to tribute where I can. But we've got two great experts that are going to be leading us and talking about what I think is a very timely issue. If you think what's going on out there, you know, the UN is meeting right now. Climate change is right at the top of what they're discussing. COP26 is just around the corner. And what WPI is doing here with this program is just really incredible. And so just a little bit of background on me before I, we go to our speakers is I am a podcaster. I host America Adapts. It focuses on how society is going to adapt to climate change. And that's my background. I used to work in the federal government, state governments, nonprofit work. And I just became obsessed with the issue of adaptation and how we communicate adaptation. And um, I interview academics, practitioners, practitioners, journalists, thought leaders in the space. It's really just been an exciting development for me. My background is in policy, and I've been able to get into this space where I get to interview people. I get to go on location. The podcast has taken me all over the world, learning how people are adapting to climate change. And if I just a little bit of a plug, one of my episodes, Dr. Linda Shai from Cornell talks about urban planning and climate equity, I think is very relevant for maybe some of the things that you're doing. And of course, I got to get a plug. I did it episode with um, Dr. Sarah Strauss and Dr. Janine Duddle he, at WPI talking about this master's program in adaptation. When I heard about it, I got all excited because not many universities are dedicating entire programs around the issue of adaptation. So you guys are one of the first. You should feel proud. And a lot of us out there are watching what you're doing, and we want you to succeed because I think as climate change rears its ugly head, we're going to have to just create a whole new professional class. And so we're... we're, we're Really excited about what you're doing here. Uh, uh, Dean Scheller also mentioned I work at Simpatico uh, Studios, which is, I have a climate adaptation channel and I interview similar people. I get into the mitigation space a little bit there too. And biggest difference is I can't wear my pajamas because I'm in front of the TV. Uh, so it's not like a podcast, so it's a little bit different, but similar conversations, just trying to create awareness around this issue of climate change. So definitely check those out. 
And you know what? Let's just jump into our panel here. And um, I'm not going to give them any background. You heard a little bit about them. But first off, it's going to be Maria Belen Power from Green Roots. And then I'll be followed by Dr. Franco Montalto from Drexel University. And then we're going to come back and have a nice discussion around some of these issues. And so, Maria Belen, let's jump, jump on to what you're doing. Thank you, Doug. Um, I think I have some slides. There we go. Great. So thank you, everyone, and thank you to WPI. My name is Maria Belen Power, and I am the Associate Executive Director at Green Roots. Green Roots is a resident-led environmental justice organization that is working to engage some of the most vulnerable residents, empower them to become strong leaders, so that together we can implement innovative projects and campaigns that improve our public health and our quality of life. Next, please. And if you hit next, you'll see Chelsea highlighted. Chelsea is the smallest and second most densely populated city in the Commonwealth. At just 1.8 square miles, Chelsea has over 45,000 residents, 73% of which identify as Latino and Latina. And like myself who came here from Nicaragua and uh, other folks who identify from other racial and ethnic backgrounds, um, about 24% live below the poverty level. And in neighboring East Boston, if you hit next, you'll see East Boston, there are about 55,000 residents who live in five square miles, even though three of those miles are occupied by Logan International Airport. So if you hit next, you'll see Logan International Airport. 53% of East Boston residents identify as Latino and Latina, and 17% live below the poverty level. Next, please. Our communities are providing some of the largest regional benefits while shouldering the burdens for air, land, water, and noise pollution from those very same industrial activities. 100% of the jet fuel that's used at Logan Airport is stored on the banks of the Chelsea Creek. 70 to 80% of the region's home heating fuel is stored on the banks of the Chelsea Creek. 400,000 tons of road salt that are used in over 350 communities in the Northeast are also stored along the banks of the Chelsea Creek. Chelsea is also home to one of the largest produce distribution centers in the nation, serving the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic States, and Southern Canadian provinces. And that brings thousands of trucks in and out of our community daily. Now, Massachusetts, despite its progressive reputation, when it comes to public health, we have some of the most profound race and class disparities. In 2016, the Center for Effective Government graded Massachusetts and only one other state, an F, for exposing people of color and residents living below the poverty level to hazardous facilities. Our communities have some of the highest rates of strokes, cardiovascular disease, and asthma hospitalization in the entire state. Next, please. Right now, we are engaged in a struggle for climate justice. The Office for Energy and Environmental Affairs gave its final approval to a proposal by Eversource to build an electrical substation on the banks of the Chelsea Creek in a dense neighborhood of East Boston, a neighborhood primarily populated by low-income residents and people of color. This substation was initially approved during a hearing in 2017 where interpretation for those residents was not provided, even though we requested it ahead of time. If built, the substation would be located on that parcel of land that you see, the red box, that not only is projected to flood, but has flooded several times in the past. It would also be next to 8 million gallons of jet fuel and next to a heavily utilized playground. This type of infrastructure is the opposite of adaptation and building for resiliency. So we will do what we do best, which is use every single tactic in the organizer's playbook and fight back against a project that will be a ticking time bomb in our community. If you hit next. This is what could happen if something goes wrong. Thank you. And I'll pass it to you, Franco.
Thank you, Maria Belen, and thank you to, um, to everybody, the organizers, for uh, this opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, so inspirational to see, see your work, Maria Belen, in, in Chelsea. Um, my background is um, formally in civil and environmental engineering. At various points in my career, I kind of flirted with the opportunity of becoming an urban planner, but the way that I ended up satisfying that need is by doing very applied community-based research and practice. I never could decide if I wanted to be only a professor or only a practitioner because I couldn't really reconcile doing exclusively research or exclusively action on the ground. And I felt that I needed both opportunities, both platforms, um, both to innovate and to have my uh, impact. So I, I, I work as a professor at Drexel University in Philadelphia in a college of engineering. Uh, and I'm also, um, uh, the founder of eDesign Dynamics, which is this firm that does uh, a variety of water, uh, urban water sustainability and resilience work. Um, these pictures just show kind of the, the, the types of projects that I get involved in. Uh, I am very much interested in cities and in making cities more sustainable and more resilient to climate risks. My specialty, my focus, my sector is, is water. Um, and I've worked uh, sort of both in sort of rural environments, as you can see in the upper right, uh, all the way down to the ultra urban environment. And you can see in the lower left, uh, a picture of some of my research on top of the Javits Center in New York City, um, which is the, the second largest green roof in the country and something I've been monitoring. Um, next slide, please. At the university, my, my focus has been on trying to innovate strategies for managing water in cities that promote the things that we really want in cities. One of the things that's been really interesting to me is that although everybody recognizes water as a, a, a critical challenge, and it was highlighted in that amazing video in the very beginning there, um, if you ask people on the ground, they're not so interested in water, they're interested in the types of, um, of opportunities and challenges that Maria Belen was talking about. But very much so, it depends on sort of how you manage water. You know, The way you manage water has all of these social, ecological, economic, and climate risk and, and, and justice implications. And so my, my lab gets down into the nitty gritty and we work with sensors and, and, and studying what happens in individual uh, sort of water management infrastructure. And you can see, I do a lot of work with natural systems, um, but we also inter interact with communities and try to figure out ways and strategies for um, using water to promote uh, community goals. So that's the, the research that I do at Drexel. And then on the next slide, um, I get an opportunity to, uh, to practice or to implement these projects uh, through my firm. And it's very much in the, the in the in the spirit of what your president had just said, theory to practice, knowledge to action. Um, that's very much how I approach my projects and my practice. I, I use the research to kind of look at the very high level, look at the theory, look at the opportunities. Uh, start the conversations, and then the practice becomes a machine for uh, churning out. I do a lot of work with greening landscapes so that they can manage water, absorb water, and become uh, better community assets. We do a lot of the simulations uh, that are required to, to sort of estimate the performance of these things. And, and we work on landscapes and waterscapes and, and on the restoration of uh, degraded and, and challenged urban ecosystems. So that's kind of in a nutshell my um, my background. The last slide that I have here is that increasingly I've been doing this work. Um, this type of work cannot be done in isolation. And I'm part of a variety of different networks um, uh, and, and, and collaborations uh, at the national scale, at the local scale, um, at the international scale that have been participating in this conversation. And in particular, I'm interested in how universities, the role that universities can play in bringing about a more resilient future. And um, so I'm, I'm sure we'll get into more of this later, but I just wanted to make that, that connection that I'm, I'm sort of talking to many other people and learning from them as I, as I do this work. And there, I guess with that, I'll hand it back over to Doug to, uh, to lead the conversation. All right, thanks, Franco. All right, everybody, just a reminder, we're gonna kick off this, um, we're gonna have a moderated conversation here, but I encourage you to write down questions. We're gonna have a Q&A toward the end of the session. If you have some great questions, please put those down because we want to encourage those. And you know, we're gonna hopefully make this as or organic as possible. If uh, the panelists here want to ask each other questions, we're gonna do that. 
you know, I, I'd be remiss not to say also, you know, use social media. If you're watching this, I'm at USA Adapts and Maria Belen and um, Frank, if you want to say when you answer a question, maybe you have a social media handle that you want people to tweet at and WPI, obviously at WPI, let's encourage some interactions out there. And so let's, let's do that. All right. So let's get started here. We're going to talk about adaptation and Frank, I'm going to start with you. And these are questions that I think you can both, t- both take a shot at, but when we think about adaptation, it's a relatively new field. Some people in the natural resource sector will, we've been doing it since the early aughts, people in the built environment, it's like the last five, 10 years. And I'm curious your own stories there. And Franco, with you, you're at Drexel University, but you also have your own private firm. How did your organizations, those, I guess those two, really start thinking about adaptation? I mean, it's not something that's been around for a while. And how, how did you start to really integrate because of the terminology and the tools and all these things? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I, I've always been interested in sustainability. And I would say if you asked me this conversation, uh, if, you, if you sort of queried me about this topic uh, about 15 years ago, I would have said, well, I'm a sustainability uh, focused professional. Um, and I can point to a specific thing that happened. I, I had an opportunity to present some of my stormwater research to the then NOAA administrator, Jane Lubchenco, back in 2011, so about 10 years ago. And I was showing her, you know, how we can green spaces and manage more water. And most of this work was motivated by um, reducing water quality impacts. Um, but we were beginning to see that, you know, some of the some of these approaches actually had other benefits. Uh, and so I entitled my presentation "Green Infrastructure as a Climate Change Adaptation Strategy?" Question mark. And the administrator in- interrupted me right there and said, "Get rid of the question mark." The, the, the work that you're doing on managing water in cities to the extent that it, inter, it, it has these ecological, social, and economic components is adaptation work. And so at that point, I took that as a mandate and I started sort of changing. I was still working with nature-based solutions. I was still working with communities, but I started to integrate into my work, um, I'd say three, three different things, um, looking at scenarios. So the types of things that we're doing, they're moot and invalid if they're not gonna work in 10 years from now. And so that was one sort of piece of this. Um, The other piece of this was to really focus on multifunctionality. So if you're building a road or if you're building a building or if you're building a power plant, as as we just heard, you're not just doing that when you're working in an ultra impacted environment. You're doing, you're impacting the quality of life in this place, the opportunities that people have. And so I started to look at everything that I was doing from, I had always looked at it from a social, ecological and economic perspective, the sort of classic ease of sustainability. But now I built in, how is this gonna get worse with climate? And, and, and that's the third. And then the th- very third piece of this that I, would, that I would say is that I started to be more intentional about how can you then, based on the, that information, how might we reconfigure what we're doing? So. So that, the, so that we're not designing things that, yes, <laughs> we'll, we'll solve yesterday's problems, but we'll solve tomorrow's problems through sort of very surgical, strategic, informed, historically relevant um, sort of modifications to, to the way we work in community. So, so that's sort of the way I define adaptation. And, and it sort of started with that, <laughs> with that critique and interruption by the NOAA administrator. And Maria Belen, before you jump into here, and I'm very curious too, as your organization has been doing environmental justice and we think of air pollution and water pollution, and there were things like sea level rise that a lot of these groups didn't have to think about before or extreme heat is that we have elevated temperatures and such. How has your organization really sort of started to tackle some of these issues on, on top of the things that you've already done? For sure, yeah. You know, we come at it from the perspective of of the people and the most vulnerable residents. And so um, I think it's important to understand the context. So like I said, a lot of the folks that live in Chelsea are Latino immigrants, um, identify as um, racial and ethnic minorities. We, um, We started doing the feasibility study for a microgrid around 2017. And, you know, we have members meetings every month. Once a month, we meet with our members and talk about our priorities. And in that meeting, it was about November of 2017, we had to um, prioritize our programs, which is which is going to be the top one, top three, top five. And the microgrid came at the very top. 
And I was shocked. And I remember talking to my colleague, there's no way this is so wonky and technical. Why are people so interested in this microgrid? And it became clear that there's a huge, we knew this, there's a huge Puerto Rican diaspora in Chelsea. And Hurricane Maria had just hit Puerto Rico. And folks were left without power for prolonged periods of time. And the folks in Chelsea were experiencing that firsthand and with their loved ones and with their relatives. And so it was clear that what happened in Puerto Rico can happen to us and probably will happen to us very soon. And we know that we're not gonna be the first neighborhood with power back on after an outage. Chelsea is not gonna be the priority for the administration. We know that communities of color, low-income communities are usually the last ones to get help. And this is what's happening, what we see happening with the climate crisis is the folks that have contributed the least to carbon emissions, the least to the climate crisis are being hit first and worse and are having the hardest time bouncing back. So honestly, as wonky and technical as it is, and it has become, I've had to go through this learning curve because we have to do this as a survival mechanism. And, and whether we call it adaptation or not, it's what we're doing on the ground, not to, not to call it adaptation to climate change, but to really connect with folks on the ground that are the most impacted why is this important? Why is energy democracy important? Why is distributed energy important? Why are these critical infrastructures in our community, why are they going to be important to keep power back on? And that's, I think that's our contribution and that's where we're coming at it is protecting and defending the people that are on the margins, the most marginalized and the most vulnerable residents in our region. All right, folks, and I, I just want to add, to, I'm getting some questions, and I, I'll, I might use those in the middle of our discussion toward the end, too. And also, even though I'm moderating this, I'm a panelist, and I, I'll, I'll answer some questions, too, if I, if I think it'll be useful. And my own experience is I work for the state government in Florida, their Wildlife Conservation Commission. It was like a 2,500-person agency. And right when I got there, they started thinking about climate change. And so I spent a, a lot of time thinking about how you institutionalize climate change into a bureaucracy and it's not easy and so we spent four or five years just how did you know first of all start integrating into budget items and so you get people starting to think about climate change and adaptation it's like you look into the dna of how an organization operates and then you get the scientists starting to think about it because it was surprising there was a lot of scientists like 500 within this agency and most of them weren't thinking about climate change at all and so you have to just reboot people's brains around this these issues and again, it, it's not sexy, but the idea of like how you master institutionalize, be it a 10 person organization, like a small environmental group or a 2000 person or, or um, bureaucracy, you, you really have to understand how these things operate because adaptation is really going to require a lot of different changes. And so my own experiences has been that, you know, you, you got to figure out what are the, the nodes of how things kind of work and kind of go from there. All right, let's go on. And you know what, um, I, Frank, I want to go back to you. And I just, some of the work that you're doing, when you're working with some partners out in the field, and you're not necessarily bringing up climate change, but it's obviously very relevant. And there's these nature-based solutions from these engineering projects. Does that even come up in some of your conversations? Or do you just kind of avoid it? Or do you bring it in? Because sometimes you don't necessarily even need to talk about it. But it, it, does it come up? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's, it's increasingly difficult to ignore, um, especially when you work at the grassroots with communities that are experiencing the impacts. I mean, you can, you can talk about it sort of in an esoteric sort of high level academic way. But when you're when you're down in, uh, in an individual neighborhood that floods where people, kids can't get to school, um, you know, or, or, or you know, where, where people are, are suffering all kinds of, of implications of climate change, it comes up. I think that, you know, to bring it together to what you were just saying earlier, Doug, that, you know, that sort of institutional, the problem is we don't have necessarily um, a, a, a law, you know, like for, there's the Clean Water Act that tells us how we need to manage water, right? We need to, we need to, a, a city, a utility has to achieve certain regulatory compliance. There is nothing that really tells us that we need to adapt. There's no law that requires adaptation. And so what I find is 
really interesting in, in these sort of community-based discussions is to come in and say, well, what are the levers that we have to work with, right? So, you know, your county, for example, or your utility, your stormwater utility in my sector is, has to manage stormwater. Okay, so they could do it in a way that barely achieves regulatory compliance at the lowest possible cost. But you, if you start a conversation with people on the ground, they can tell you a way to do it to, to get the same regulatory compliance, oftentimes at the same or less cost, but in a way that sort of touches the local basis. And so I find it really interesting to kind of talk to community members as, um, you know, and to sort of elicit their knowledge, like build them into as actually knowledge providers and designers in these projects because of their deep understanding of both what happens when an extreme event occurs on the ground, and then what would be an appropriate sort of approach. So, you know, uh, Dr. Scheller and I worked together a, a couple of years back on a project in Haiti, and this was after the 2010 earthquake. And, you know, afterwards there was this sort of promise of all this money and most of it didn't arrive, but then the government was coming in and saying, you know, we're gonna rebuild infrastructure. And they were gonna do it in a way that the community already knew would keep them vulnerable to the next earthquake. And, you know, whereas when we went in and started talking with community members and saying, well, what do you think should happen? They had a whole bunch of ideas that would still provide those infrastructure services, but could do so in a way that reduced their risk. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of the way that I go about it is kind of almost sneaky, you know, come in and say, look, here's the regulatory lever that we have. What do you think? And then, and then try to weave those ideas into a, a, a co-generated strategy for, for how to achieve those things. But there's this sort of secondary multi, multiple functions in there that, that, that focus on some of the adaptation strategies and, and equity strategies that, that we need. You know, I, I, I think you said, Franco, that um, it's harder to ignore. I think it's becoming a lot harder to ignore climate change for the city of Boston and for the governor as much as they have tried because, you know, the city of Boston came out with um, a, a, a Boston plan for the waterfront to become more resilient. And meanwhile, they were moving forward with this substation on a parcel of land that has flooded next to 8 million gallons of jet fuel where the residents, not only the residents, but we, really mobilized allies all across the state. Hundreds of testimony, hours and hours of hearings and testimony saying, please don't do it. You have other options, you have other locations. And they were like, la, 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 I don't hear you, I don't hear you, we're moving forward because this is just status quo. And it's very difficult to go up against a utility who is an investor owned utility who is gonna make money out of this investment. We're all gonna pay for it. All the ratepayers in the greater Boston area are gonna pay for it. So this is where it is becoming harder and harder for also the status quo, the government agencies, the cities to ignore it. And we're hoping that they do hear it and that you know the case is now in front of the Supreme Judicial Court to say this parcel of land where this substation is gonna go, it was supposed to be a soccer field a soccer field that could flood and recede. Why are you doing a substation? Why don't you do it in the airport where it's safe, where it's 24 hour security? So there are, this is a piece around people coming in and telling you what the solutions are, where people on the ground know what the answers are. They know what the best solutions are. And what we, all of us, including government needs to do is really just listen and trust that the people on the ground have the solutions for the climate crisis. Can I go to that real, real quick, Doug? No, go ahead, Franco, please. Yeah, I just, you know, the, you know in, in the spirit of what we're talking about here, WPI's program on, on adaptation, I would say another constituency that I think knows what needs to be done are students. I mean, I think it's the students come into a university and are often, I mean, not speaking specifically about any one university, but I will say in general, as someone who interacts with a lot of youth about climate issues, beginning with my individual, my own kids, they are usually disillusioned by what they see happening in 
the, the, the organizations that they're participating in. They're not getting enough of this. They understand it's their future that is at stake. And, you know, th there's a value proposition to us who want to stay in, you know, in a position of relevance, which is not just to sort of elevate the ideas that come from the ground, but then, you know, to address people where they want to see solutions. And students are, you know, students are demanding action. The youth in general are demanding action around the world all the time. And are we listening to them? I'd say WPI through this program has created a place where they can nurture that interest. Um, but I think we need to see a lot more of that happening from institutions, whatever they are, whether the universities or cities or, 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 or otherwise. Um, and I, I think Marie Belen makes a, an excellent point. It's just fascinating. I'm based in Tucson, Arizona, originally from Florida, and I haven't spent that much time up in New England. But your, your, your point about the city not listening to you, it's just this whole issue of adaptation can be very localized. And in these local decisions, you might not have the support of your, the city or the state. And, but at the same time, I listen in, in, in the big picture, like Massachusetts and the city are doing amazing. Because I came from Florida, and for a few years there, the governor, I was there when the governor banned the use of the word climate change. And um, we had to go underground. We literally took down our website at the state agency talking about climate change. But it, you, Marie Belen, what you just described is these are real world actions. And when you get down to the local decision making, I think there's going to be a, a lot of um, learning and I guess ground truthing what's really going on with climate adaptation. So you think you have the political support out there, all the rhetoric seems to be there, but what's really happening at those micro levels, that's, you know, hopefully we can learn from these things. And um, well, I wanna pivot a little bit, uh, we're talking about climate justice and um, maybe Franco would take a crack at this first, and then I'm gonna to get to some of the, we've got a couple of questions that have come in, but I'm curious because climate justice and Marie Boleyn, you might think this is old news, but in some ways it's kind of a, an emerging topic in the field of adaptation. People in my space, we had, didn't really think about it. It didn't feel like into the last three to five years. How do you really integrate that into climate adaptation planning? Because I think of some of the planning that I've been involved in and just like, how do you even plug it in besides it just being sort of an afterthought or some line at the end where it's just this superficial thing. And Franco with some of the engineering projects that you're doing, you're working with cities. How do you like re legitimately bring it into the work that you're doing? And Frank, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to be clear, I mean, the, 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 when we're talking about climate justice, just for folks who are in the room, we're talking about the fact that the impacts of climate change are not distributed evenly and, and, yep. uh, and, and the problem itself is not distributed evenly. So there are culprits and there are victims and, um, and we need to sort of be aware of that. And I think, you know, speaking in my field in engineering, where you know there has always been this idea that technology dominates. You know, if we can do it, we should do it. Technology can solve all problems. Um, you know, technical solutions. Like, trust me, I know I did the calculations. It has to be this way. We got to throw all of that out the door. And I think that the best way, you know, what for me is the best way to do that is to make it vivid uh, to the problem solvers, quote unquote, problem solvers through interaction or through working directly in partnership, equal level with community, with community groups. And so that, because what, what then happens is um, the problem is better defined. You know, the engineers will come and look at it the way the textbook told them, hey, well, I have to put an en energy substation here, uh, you know, or I have to manage this much water. So I'm going to create this line, or I'm gonna create this impact on the landscape. But that's a landscape where people are you know, raising families and, and there's a history to that place and there's an ecosystem. So what I do as an educator is I do, I am 100% dedicated to problem-based learning. All of my projects immerse students in a particular place and put them in uncomfortable situations and elevate a community partner as the class client. Um, and, and then the students, without me telling them, learn from those interactions that there's more criteria that they need to address than just the technical criteria. Um, and, and that, you know, I, I would say that, you know, that, that works. Uh, and I, and I, again, I was really excited to see that piece of this program, uh, you know, this, this sort of immersion uh, component. Um, I would say like on the, on the practice side, you know, sometimes you have a client that asks for a very specific thing and um, you have to give them that thing and you have to work within the budget and you have to work within this, the timeline of the project. 
But when it comes to delivering um, a professional service, I'm a professional engineer. Um, and if you take seriously the, the liability that you have, uh, you know, I, I can't in good faith uh, sign on to projects that I feel are putting the public at risk in, in view of, you know, so, so it's beginning to impact and you're seeing it sort of in the engineering profession, you're seeing it in insurance, you're seeing it in lots of professions where, you know, as, as we sort of better understand the, the sort of justice implications of what we're doing, people say, look, I, I can't put my name on that project. And, and that, that has come up. There, there, there have been situations like that. But I would say, you know, to me, the best way to address climate justice is to elevate the voices of the folks who are supposed to benefit from the projects we're doing and to have them tell us how to do those projects. Yeah, Very brilliant, for, please. Yeah, for us, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, but climate justice is like Frankel said, the, the folks who have contributed the least to carbon emissions are being hit the worst. And, you know, I, I talk about um, uh, the substation and what could, what could go there instead of a substation, where the substation could go and how we're building the solutions for that very same problem by building a microgrid, a community led microgrid. And so in climate justice, the way we see our work and we do our work is, we're fighting the bad and we're building the new, pro providing the solutions and working towards those very same solutions. We're not just here complaining about the government, complaining about the utility, but we're actually learning how do we do this community-led microgrid. And that is climate justice, putting the power back in the hands of the people and letting them lead. I think you know the piece around the impacts of climate change not having an equal impact on every resident or all residents, regardless of race and, and income, is, is just simply not true. People experience the environment very differently. You know, Chelsea is an urban heat island. 40, I'm sorry, 80% of our surfaces are impervious, 80%. Our, our such, uh, hot summer days are 20 to 50 degrees higher than neighboring cities. And so, you know, we talk about uh, climate change, extreme weather, extreme heat, and it does, it's not going to impact the same when it's a really hot summer season, communities like Chelsea that are, have less tree canopy uh, as compared to other communities in the greater Boston area that have more parks, more open space, more blue and green spaces. And, and then we get hit by COVID, which I'm sure won't be the last pandemic. And people are stuck inside in extreme heat with high electricity bills. And so it, this is a real problem that has very inequitable impacts on people. And in fact, has a higher burden on, on black and brown communities. And it's, you know, we saw it with Hurricane Ida. There were folks dying in Louisiana not from the hurricane, not from the water, but from the heat, from extreme heat. That's not gonna happen in a wealthy community, in a white community. It has a very disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, on immigrant communities, on low-income folks. And so I, that's really at the core of what we do and how we do it, is that the folks who are the most impacted have to be at the center and have to be leading the solutions like the microgrid, like white roofs, like transforming a parcel of land into a green space, like creating more open space, having access to the waterfront, uh, creating, uh, reducing heat through misting stations. There are so many different things that, are, that we have the solutions for. We're coming up with the solutions from the ground up. I, I've discovered just through my podcast and the conversations I have with some of these thought leaders, it, Florida is always ground zero for all the sort of crazy things out there, but even climate justice can get complicated very quickly. And you, you, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term climate gentrification. There's parts of Miami where real estate people are going in, they're buying up houses in these neighborhoods. And Little Haiti is, I think, one of the target areas because it's literally like three feet higher than some of the other coastal areas. And so they're going up and purchasing homes. These homeowners are getting prices at a much higher rate than they probably thought they'd ever get, but it's breaking up the, these historically you know, diverse communities. 
and people don't want that. And, but it's, you know, people who are selling their homes be like, well, I wanted to sell my home. And it just, it gets complicated very quickly. And you're going to see that going up and down the coast as we get through thinking about managed retreat and having to, and Florida is just, you know, <laughs> they haven't even really thought about managed retreat the way they should, but it's just, it's complicated. It's very interesting. And what are some of the solutions? There's not a lot of easy solutions for those kinds of issues and um, making us think different ways. Can I jump in for a sec? I just wanted to say, you know, just to build on what Maria Belen just said, you also, to do adaptation work, it's not going to be easy. We're, you know, the adaptation work is going to get us into some complex, difficult, and painful conversations uh, on, on all sides. And, you know, that, that has to be, and, and I don't know that we're necessarily um, all trained, depending on sort of what our point of entree is into the conversation, whether we come in as a technical expert, we come in as an organizer, we come in as a policymaker, we come in as a community activist, we don't all speak the same language, and the the concerns that are being brought to the that, that are being brought to the to the fore in these conversations are going to be uncomfortable, and they're going to challenge us, and they're going to require us to, you know, double think our, our the, the sort of underlying assumptions uh, behind our previous action, and they're going to make us learn, and they're going to make us change, and that so I, I you know that to me is like a, a really important. Uh, I learned this first hand this past summer, we, we tried to develop a coalition of people to talk about climate needs, research needs in Philadelphia. And there were, you know, scientists who didn't like working with the community folks and the community folks who felt that their voices were not represented among the scientists. And so it, it's a difficult place, but I, that's the only way forward. I think it, it is also difficult because the, the definition of the experts is changing. And who is the expert? And who gets to make the call? Who gets to make the final decision? And I think that's one of the most important takeaways in solving the climate, the climate crisis is we can electrify everything, we can reduce emissions, but if we don't shift the balance of power, if we don't tilt it back to the people, to the most vulnerable, we're not, we're not really doing anything to help those communities. And we're not really doing anything to, uh, to prevent more vulnerable communities from dying and from being impacted by, by the climate crisis. Because in the end, I mean, sort of capitalism, capitalism is not working for the poor. It's not working for the sick. And we have to change the, the system so that those people, us, communities like Chelsea and East Boston are prioritized and protected. And that's, that's difficult for the folks that have been in power for so long. It is going to be a shift and it has to happen. So guys, I'm going to start bringing a couple of questions and I want to encourage people out there now to ask their questions. We have a chat room. There's a Q&A tool in the, in the Zoom. So please, I've got a couple that I'm going to ask now. And I think we can all take a crack at answering them. Um, but then at the end, I sort of want to wrap it around and just stick with you two about a couple of questions about the program that I think I want to get you guys to answer. But let's I want to be you know, mindful of, okay, here's a question. Um, an anonymous way to help reduce future climate change is to minimize population growth. How can all of you inform folks to choose to have less, to know more than two children, each couple? Have you thought to talk to the world religious leaders to get this message across and to use them to help? My quick response to that is that I th don't bring population growth into this discussion. You know, it's a uh, Western uh, countries versus developing countries. And I, yeah, it's it's fraught. I mean, it's it's about educating you know people there, educating women, giving women economic opportunities. And so when you start talking about population growth and climate change, you're gonna just it's really an unfair way to approach what's really going on out there. That's my opinion. But it, thanks for the question. I just what you guys want to take a crack at it. I I mean I think it's putting the blame on the victim again. It's victimizing the ones who are at risk. And you know we look at religion and how religion has been uh, exported to other countries. And, and it just, it creates a much bigger divide, uh, a racial and wealth divide between those who have the choice and those who don't. And I'll just say, it, I think the question also ignores culture, you know, and, and that there are, and, and I think that's a problem with a lot of adaptation in particular. I've seen that, you know, that problem uh, come up in this in the managed retreat argument oftentimes so just ignoring 
that there are cultural practices, there are communities that have cultural attributes and characteristics that are valuable to those people. So if you if you look at the problem from purely, and here I am an engineer saying this, but purely from numbers context, and you say, hey, get away from the coast because if you, if you stay there, you're going to be underwater. But you ignore the fact, and this has come up in a project that I'm working on in Philadelphia, in Eastwick, where you have an intact middle-class African-American community in a flood-prone neighborhood. The, this, the, the insult of suggesting that that community should be uprooted to go somewhere else um, is it's completely ignorant of the sort of cultural practices that people hold dear and near to their heart, whether it's religion or anything else. So I, I think that you know, adaptation has to, it's yet another sort of base that we have to touch. It has to be culturally appropriate. And, you know, to just, you know, tell everyone that they have to stop having kids or they have to move out of the place where their ancestors lived is, is kind of disingenuous. Okay, here's another question and um, from Ruth the Rodandi. Um, Thank you for your interesting event. I was wondering how you consider climate change adaptation in context of intense Tourismification. I haven't seen it used that way. I like that. It's essentially, where localities rely on tourism generated income, but tourism doesn't actually intensifies pollution and climate catastrophe. In my two cents, it's just it's just how economic development is going to unfold, independent of just being tourism or sort of a heavy industry. Is that you need to start factoring in the carbon footprint of all these different things? And are you going to do tourism in places that are going to be impacted by sea level rise or by extreme heat? And I don't think the tourist industry has really gotten their heads around it. And I think the only thing I've seen really tied with climate change and tourism is like, there. what's it called? Just it's climate tourism, but it's like visit the glaciers before they're gone. And so it's, it's sort of this morbid approach to tourism. But um, yeah, Marie Belen, do you have a, any an answer to that? No, I mean, I think I think you're right. The tourism industry has to sort of wrap its head around it. We um, you know, the, the communities of color and low-income communities that live in the greater Boston area are not really benefiting the most out of tourism in the greater Boston area. And so we have to figure out what is the real impact, the carbon footprint of, of the tourism in our area, but what is the impact on the local economy? What is the impact on the most vulnerable communities? Um, yeah, it sort of connects also to, to the price of pollution, to the price of carbon, who's paying for that? Um, and, and what is the impact of, 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 the, of that pollution? Who, who is being impacted the most um, by that tourism and by that pollution? And, and I'll just add, I think, you know, there, again, it's, it's kind of like the previous question that if you turn it into a black and white, this versus that, and you, you don't look at the nuances that are possible through creative planning, creative design, creative uh, sort of thinking. I mean, I just came up in a project that I'm involved in or was involved in funded by the Green Climate Fund in Grenada. So Grenada relies on tourism. It's a small island developing state. It relies on tourism. If you look at their main tourist stretch, it's going to be underwater. So, you know, the scientist who's divorced from sort of the local context would say, you got to close, you, you should move those, you should move those hotels. But then you've, you've, you've completely cut the legs off of the local economy. So, so then is there a way that you can have, and this gets into adaptation, right? Is there a way that you can adapt the economy, adapt the tourism so that it's a more sustainable form of tourism? It doesn't address the emissions associated with air, you know, aircraft travel and all that. But, but I, I just think that you know, to, to have a, a, a sort of carte blanche position on tourism um, takes away from the creativity. We, we need creative solutions. We're not going to adapt by thinking the old way. We have to think about new ways. And again, the, the economic implications of, of, of what we do are, are, are significant, especially given the inequalities that we have economically from community to community. And Rodandi just did a follow-up comment of just, you know, Venice is underwater already, which is a good point. And they've built this huge kind of, it's not a levee, but this huge elaborate system out in the bay to keep the water out. And it it sounds like it's had some minor success, but it's not meant for the sea level rise that's anticipated. So yes, I think a lot of tourism is actually going to be transitional. If you think of some of these um, South Pacific countries that their whole you know, economies rely on tourism, but at the same time, parts of their government are negotiating with New Zealand and Australia to sort of say, well, when sea level rise comes, we need a place to go. 
and they're going to have to abandon these entire places. And so you're going to have tourism in the meantime, which you can't blame them, but, and then they're already thinking about, we're not going to even exist as a country 30, 40, 75 years from now. Venice is a great example. I bring my students uh, actually to uh, meet up with a WPI professor, uh, Professor Fabio Carrera, who runs your Venice Project Institute, because I think Venice is, is really interesting, right? There's a his, uh, people have historically lived amidst water. And so there's this sort of dreamy way about how, what that might look like, then superimposed with these big events that sort of devastate the city. Um, so you've got historical and contemporary. I, I've spoken to the, the folks who designed that big storm surge barrier, and they know that it's only gonna protect for maybe 30, 40 years, but the averted damages over 30, 40 years sort of warrant the cost. So it's like you're saying, Doug, it's sort of an interim measure as we figure out the longer term vision. Um, and, and, you know, but that the interim measure, the impacts tomorrow matter uh, in, in our lives. Uh, Marie, but Belen, did you have anything you want to add there? No, I think um, I think it really connects to, to the movement of people and migration and what is what's happening with people being displaced and also locally with, you brought this up earlier, Doug, with, um, with climate gentrification and, and housing. And, you know, we, we have started working on anti-displacement and some folks are like, well, why is Green Roots doing housing now, doing displacement? Because we cannot improve the communities that we live in, make it more, make it healthier, uh, more attractive without thinking about land use, about the cost of living and the very same people that are uh, fighting so hard for these victories are now being displaced to locations that are, again, polluted and unhealthy. And the newer folks get to enjoy, get to reap the benefits of the environmental justice victories. Okay, I want to go back to just a couple of questions. You know, we've got we're in the about ten minutes left. But if you still have some questions, throw them out there. And but I do want to get um, Franco and Mer Berlin's thoughts. And well, okay, we just got a question from Sarah Strauss. I want to ask this, but I do want to say someone wrote Fabio wrote. I'm in Venice right now, and I'm working on creating an alternative economy. That's a bit cryptic, but thank you, Fabio. I, <laughs> that's all about Hi, Fabio. Yes, um, Sarah, Sarah, I'm going to get Sarah's question here. What is the most important thing? Great. I was going to go shift into that program. What the thing that the CCA program can teach our students that will help them support community climate adaptation in different locales? And Maria Belen, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think, you know, our sort of biggest takeaway and and it's it sort of applies differently to the focus of the students and um, and where they're studying or what is their area of interest. But I, I think the biggest takeaway for us has been people go really far to learn about inequity and to learn about poor countries and third world countries and uh, trying to fix the problems over there far away. And there are communities that are disinvested, that are marginalized, probably really close to where we all live. And so the idea of uh, working towards equity, working towards equity and social change within our own community, within our own backyard, is really important. You folks, folks in the Greater Boston area, students in the Greater Boston area, don't have to go to Nicaragua, where I'm from, to learn about poverty and inequity. They can come to Chelsea. And so, our uh, the I think the other lesson for us, or the other um, recommendation and takeaway is to really listen to the folks that are on the ground doing the work and have probably been doing it for decades. And so um, this can happen locally and this can happen if you choose to go to another country and learn about issues in another country is really invest time and energy and spend a significant amount of time learning about the local players and what is the work that they have been doing probably for decades in addressing some of the local problems with their own solutions. So I think that in order to not come in and helicopter in with your own external solutions, really getting to know who are the players on the ground, what are their, what, what, have, what work have they done and what is the local context? Because the local context is the most important thing in addressing the local issues for those communities. Thank you. Franco. 
mean, I'd say there, there are sort of three, um, three things that I think are most important. Uh, the first is to develop, sort of develop and give comfort or support students in, uh, in authentic forms of engagement. You know, they, 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 I think, especially if your WPI is a technical school, um, you know, looking at the intended beneficiaries of your project, not just as the beneficiaries of your project, but as partners and as experts. And, and to, and it's not, we're not traditionally trained as a design community to do that. You know, there's, there's public participation, but it's often, here's my wonderful idea. You like it? Okay, good. It's not, hey, let's do this together. So number one, I think, is to teach those strategies. And there are strategies. How do you do that authentically and, and in a way that makes people all feel like you're part of a team that's working? So that's number one. The second is to not look at anything that we do in a monofunctional way. You know, if you're designing infrastructure, if you're setting up a policy, it's going to have social, ecological, and economic impacts. And climate is going to accelerate some of those impacts in different ways. It might, it might not. But you need to sort of look at a roadway, look at a building, look at a wastewater treatment plant, you know, you know as, as something that has those different um, potential impacts, but could also have potential benefits. You know, so, so that's why I'm very interested in green infrastructure and continue to work in green infrastructure because it can beautify communities, because it can create decentralized forms of jobs, because... You know, it, it's got all kinds of uh, multifunctional benefits, and that's part of what we need. And then the third, I would say, is just to, to avoid um, this sort of localized conceptualization of the problem and to look at both the sort of local impacts of global trends. So you can't ignore the climate trends. You need to be able to look at the reports. You need to be able to understand what's going to happen um, and, and to factor that into what you're doing locally. But you also need to look at the global impacts of the local, you know, so, you know, if you're back to the tourism question, uh, you know, there, there are larger scale impacts of the things that we do in an individual site that that we need to think about. And again, you know, I think the traditional way in my field in particular, I love to pick on engineers, is that the client rules. But no, the client is in society and society is is, you know, has so all these resilience challenges and adaptation challenges and sustainability challenges and equity challenges. and so. We need to look at the projects in this broader context. And I think students will appreciate um, that contextualization. Okay, I'm gonna give my two recommendations too. First off, and is because you've started this master's program that really drill in the, you know, the difference between adaptation and resilience. I think that just doesn't get enough attention. So much attention has been shifted to resilience. Everyone has a different definition of resilience. You have a lot of people thinking we can just climate proof our community indefinitely. Adaptation builds in for things like managed retreat. You're giving up on an area. Florida needs to start having these conversations. And I think there's a tendency to sort of say, well, we can climate proof everything and just really drilling to your students that we are in a brave new world. Adaptation means might means making you know big decisions and it might mean some big sacrifices too. So I would really, that that's a philosophical discussion that you might be having with your students, but I think it really gives them in their head sort of, I feel resilience is a tactic under the strategy of adaptation. And then second is just, and you know, Franco talked about this a bit, but just learning how to communicate the issue of adaptation. We're gonna be spending decades communicating to the public what's going on. This is what's happening. These are the impacts that's happening. We are terrible communicators and there's just not a lot of, adaptation of communication going on there is many opportunities you can give your students the ability to communicate these issues, taking these different courses. And I think people shortchange the art of communication. You know, they, there's a lot of efforts right now to try to train scientists to be better communicators. And that's great. We want them to be that, but they're scientists. It's sort of like having a professional communicator and saying, we're going to train you to be a physicist. We wouldn't look at it that way. Let's have a bit more respect for the profession of the communication. And so, but really make it a core part of what you're doing there. So yeah, those are my two areas. I could go on, but those are the big areas. But um, we have just a few more minutes. And what I wanna do is um, uh, to sort of wrap things up with the panel. And we have these students, this new program. It's a very exciting program. And if you could maybe offer some advice on, you know, what sort of, you know, it, advice would you give them as they start off on this journey of getting an adaptation degree or getting into these fields? What recommendations would you have? And just, you know, what sort of like, you know, cheerleading to what, what, what's going on here? Let's, Maria Belen, let's start off with you. 
Yeah, I mean, I will quote our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and I will say that those closest to the pain have to be closest to the power. And in really shifting um, and, and, and students being part of that change of prioritizing the communities that have been the most excluded and giving power to those communities. And you, the students, being the voice and the actors in shifting that dynamic in prioritizing black and brown communities, immigrant communities, low income residents, non English speaking, who have been marginalized for decades. Thank you, Franco. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, even if you don't, even if you come to this event and you choose to not pursue a career in adaptation, you're going to work on adaptation because there are adaptation jobs out there for sure. But there's also, you know, adaptation needs are being built into climate impacts are now build, being built into just about every decision that's, that's being made. And, you know, so you will have to become good at understanding and navigating these questions. I would sort of invite every student to, to sort of ask themselves, though, if whatever it is, whether it's a deliberate, adapt, you know, inter participation in an adaptation project or another project and you think you're bringing in the climate perspective, ask yourself, is this project actually remedying, is it making the world a better place? Is it making this project a better place? And that means being honest about the history, like how did we get here and what, what is this situation all about? How did it, you know, who's impacted? Why are they impacted? What are the power dynamics at play? What are the regulatory constraints? Who are the decision makers? And then figure out if the project that you're talking about or the approach to the project that you're talking about is, it can, can improve things over that baseline condition. And if it can't, it's not really adaptation, even if it in, involves a big storm surge barrier or, you know, or, or a bunch of misting stations, it, it, it should be really having a tangible impact on quality of life in the communities. And, and that's, I think, where, um, you know, I, I think is a, an individual discussion project focused uh, that every, every one of us is going to have to have more frequently. And what I'd like to say is that you guys are very lucky. I wish I had a master's program in adaptation. A lot of us have shifted mid-career doing some of these things from what we were doing previously. You were very fortunate that way. I give this pre presentation called the Adaptation, the Greatest Story Never Told, because people don't realize that, that it's out there. I think adapting to climate change, and I honestly believe this, will be the greatest challenge that humanity has ever faced. And it's not getting the attention that deserves. And you guys are going to be so influential. We're still just winging it out there. We think we know that we're doing all the right things, but it's this emerging topic. You can be so influential. That's very exciting. I think being a student, starting off as a professional. So I think I encourage you just to seize the day with this issue because we're, we're going to spend the next 500 years working on it. And on that note, I do want to stick to the time. Dean Scheller, I'm going to just pivot over to you. I want to thank Franco and Maria Bellin for joining me on this panel. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Franco, Maria Bella. And that was such an enriching conversation. And uh, we actually are going to continue the conversation a little bit longer. And we continue to invite audience questions. But I also wanted to just sort of bring in some of the, the questions from our side of the room here. And one of the big topics you brought up is I bet a lot of young people, I think, feel a sense of climate anxiety and climate dread, and it can be very immobilizing, right? People are stressed out, they're anxious, and they don't know how we're going to move forward. And I just wondered if you could give us some positive stories of, okay, this was a community that got together and did something. Here's an example of something that was successful, just to, to help motivate us. Um, and I'm thinking of this in the context of, I just came from a conference at, um, in the North of England called Decarbonate, which was more about climate um, carbon mitigation strategies, but there was a regional youth climate assembly um, in Yorkshire and Humber. And the, these high school kids were amazing and they formed an assembly and they've written a manifesto and they're trying to instigate change at the community level um, across small towns and cities in the North of England. So do you have any really like good motivating, positive experiences you could share with us? What do you, what do you want to take a crack, Franco? You want to start first? Um, sure, I can just talk about a project that I'm involved in right now that is um, two projects that I'm involved in right now that are really exciting. Um, the, the first is a, um, 
is a is a flooding project in in Philadelphia um, in a community that floods a lot and the discussion about adaptation had really been narrowed down to um, building a levee and um, redeveloping some vacant land. And the community was really feeling um, sort of ignored in that discussion because redeveloping the vacant land, some of the land that would be vacant is higher elevation. And why should new people come into this community when the people who are there are feeling this vulnerability. And so I got some students involved. They interviewed a hundred people in the community um, and then co-developed with the community a plan, a land swap concept, you know, an idea of moving instead of redeveloping the vacant land and bringing in new people, um, um, re relocating folks who are in the most flood prone parts of that community to higher elevation land so that they can stay in their community and reduce their flood risk. And so this started, you know, modestly with a student project, then we got some research funds and it's now a conversation that um, is, is happening with, uh, with congressional representatives, it's, it's, it's local uh, state and, uh, and, and even some, some folks are, at the federal level are it's not necessarily going to happen. I, I'm not don't want to go on record as saying that, you know, this little conversation led to uh, a, a permanent change or a, a change that's committed to. But but I just think that the, the story, the fact that there's a discussion growing comes out of, you know, on the ground, just efforts to to bring together some of these sort of climate and equity questions. And I consider that very uplifting. And another one I'll just talk about quickly we got some funding to produce some heat risk reduction strategies for the, the hottest neighborhood in Philadelphia. And we built something like 150 shade structures um, with the, working with the local Esperanza, which is the local community-based organization. And what the community said is that, yes, I mean, we put some umbrellas up and we put some planters in and we put some benches, but really the biggest benefit of this project was that it started a discussion. Everybody now is like, why are you doing that? Why, what, what is this all about? Who's involved? Why, are you, you know, what's, what's the, I want one of those. And it sort of started a bigger conversation. And so I think I see of adaptation, you know, it can shake the tree. All of these sort of problems that we've had for a long time, maybe, uh, and maybe this is a source of sort of optimism, maybe it can get us to focus a little bit more on those problems that have been ignored for so long. Oh, I've got an example. Oh, Marie Blank, go ahead. You had, I have an example, but go ahead. I was just going to share, you know, I think one of the most um, exciting and also uh, technical and wonky is probably the microgrid in addressing um, energy and addressing um, in, in adapting our energy distribution system and providing a way for folks to keep power on when there are power outages. This is a community led microgrid in Chelsea. There are other initiatives and projects that my colleagues are also working on, like inst installing a berm around the island and river in Chelsea, which really gets right up to right next to the New England Produce Center. And so protecting the areas around um, the New England Produce Center. Uh, so those are a couple of, of the examples of things that we're working on. And Dean, I apologize. I was working off an old agenda, so I was I was trying to be sticking to the schedule. And I know we've got this extra fifteen minutes. That's why I kind of did that. Um, so one of the conversations I had with it was with a woman who travels around the South Pacific and visits islands and helps them with adaptation planning. And she was telling me a story on the podcast about this particular island. I think the Solomon Islands and just some indigenous people there. How you do adaptation planning and really just a tiny community with their own cultural norms and such. And she goes and she and she kind of they have whiteboarding and they're talking about adaptation on the island and such. But women and men don't meet together. It's just one of the things, even though she was a woman leading this, the men and the women of the village don't meet and do this stuff together. And so how she did the adaptation planning was they got all the women in the room and they did adaptation planning. And obviously they have their own perspective and skill set. And then the men came in and they did the sort of same thing. And then she was able to sort of integrate those two things. But then when they were done with that planning, what I thought was so kind of odd, but it was great and, and kind of inspiring too, is that everyone comes together when they actually do the adaptation actions. And so there was lots of some coastal restoration work that needed to happen. And so everyone, it wasn't separated by gender at that stage, 
But the, she had to be, you know, sensitive to the fact that if you're bringing people together, having these sort of tougher conversations, you had to have these gender issues factoring in. But at the end of the day, the, the island came together and they were able to do some, something very positive. And I thought that sort of flexibility, that sort of sausage making is going to be occurring all over the world. And so I think we can do it if we just kind of appreciate those cultural norms. Can I, can I add one other thing? Just Mimi, I, I had an event last week uh, focusing on the new IPCC report, and we had a speaker, Cynthia Rosenzweig from NASA Goddard Institute of Space Studies, and we asked her the same question you just asked us. And she brought up something really interesting was this new IPCC report that came out this summer um, for the first time started to provide regional assessments of risks. You know, there's always been you know, IPCC global risks. But now, you know, for example, our area here is in the Eastern United States region, and they've now talked about the different risks. And so this is good news for those of us who are on the ground um, in those places. We now have slightly more specific information, uh, which, it, you know, is going to make us better at, at doing this work. And I think you're just going to see more and more of that. We're going to get more and more local uh, with, 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 describing the risks that we're facing. Yeah, that's great. Those are all fabulous examples, um, positive examples of what's happening and what's changing. And I wanted to circle back to another comment um, Doug made earlier about the importance of communication. And one of the other programs we have at the Global School is called the Global Lab. And the Global Lab is helping teach both faculty and students and special Global Lab fellows, how can we communicate better about what we're doing, how can we use visual methods, how can we use podcasting, um, how can we use programs like this, right, to broadcast what we're doing. And it reminds me also of um, when Franco and I worked on that project in Haiti back in 2010, that when we came back um, about a year later with the outcomes and the report to sort of share with the community and with local organizations, one of the first things the group said to us was, why didn't you bring the radio station, right? Where's the, we, we wanna hear this, this, the media cover this, where's the story? And so I just wondered, Doug, especially you, if you could comment and the others too on the importance of communicating this using different means of communication and really getting into different kinds of local um, networks of, of communicating about community climate adaptation and how you do that. Yeah, I, I'll, I guess I'll start into, um... We're still figuring that out. You know, there, there, you look at the broader news coverage of it. And, you know, if you, I, I think the New York Times climate beat has been doing some really interesting where they got Christopher Flabel, who's their adaptation reporter. And I think he's done a fantastic job. Most people, most Americans have no clue that it's even a field. And I think most people, even in environmental fields, don't even understand what climate adaptation is. And so my podcast, you know, I like to think I'm targeting a lot of, you know, people in the randomly out there in the public listen to it. But there's a lot of you know, climate professionals, people in the adaptation space. It's more, it's an educational kind of podcast. It's not like the sort of more broader awareness kind of medium. And when it comes to like the different, it's, you know, you're, I did an interview with someone from the Aspen Institute where they're trying to bring climate change into schools. And you think this would already be the case, but elementary schools, middle schools. And, you know, I obviously asked, well, what about adaptation? Because most of the time it's just the mitigation and the carbon side that's top but no they they also want to talk we're going to have to be dealing and so it's it's going to take that kind of commitment of like and you have to look out decades before i think we reach a critical mass where a lot of people are starting to think about this um i and, and i do want to make a point too is like the wildfires in california i had a recent conversation about this it seems like they're bringing climate change into that a lot more but there's sort of a tone to it that like if you know this is the year we have to do something, we we have to convince the public. And it's like no, this is going to happen every year. And so I think the media is still learning on like how you wrap urgency around something that's here permanently, and they still haven't figured out how to communicate to the public that way. So I kind of ramble a little bit, but I think one thing I'll I'll say is the urgency. Also, we when we think about how to communicate about the work that we do, it. It, it's combining the urgency with the hope. We can't be, um, the world's gonna end tomorrow and there's nothing we can do about it, but rather the urgency connected with the hope that if we do work now, if we do implement the solutions now, we can change the track. Um, I, 
I think, you know, as a small nonprofit environmental justice organization that's community based, we have, we, we face challenges in how do we um, share our narrative, who picks up our stories, because you could be doing amazing work. And, but if you're not being covered, or if there's not a good story about the work that you're doing, there's no, there's no coverage, and then there's no funding. And so there is this struggle of who gets coverage and how and when, and when a reporter calls, you jump, you say yes, because this is the chance for our story and our narrative to get into the public dialogue. I'll just add up, piggyback on that and say that this is a place where I think, again, the youth can really help, uh, you know, because the youth communicate in all kinds of ways that I know I don't understand. And those forms of communication are the ones that hit these big, massive segments of the population. And just to Maria Belen's point, if you, you know, th th there's a role for the youth to lead uh, through their knowledge of how this generation in particular is, is organizing, especially like in this, you know, in this period of COVID when so many people were trapped in their houses. I know it hasn't kept my 10 year old from communicating with friends. How are they doing that? How is that? How are those messages getting out there? And I think, you know, that's really where, where, where the youth can give us lots of fresh new ideas. Yeah, that's great. Um, I guess we're going to need to get on TikTok, right? Not, not Twitter. <laughs> um, so we're kind of coming to the close of our uh, initial panel discussion here. And just for our audience, um, I want to let you know that we're going to be taking a 15 minute break and then returning with our seven lightning talks from teams of students and faculty who are doing project-based work um, at WPI through our global project centers. So take a break, take a stretch, get something to drink and come back. And I wanna thank our panelists, Doug Parsons, Franco Montato, Maria Belen Power for our fabulous discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, coming back into the session now. So thank you all for returning after our excellent uh, first part of today's community climate adaptation uh, event. And now we are going to be moving to the lightning talk session. So I'm Professor Sarah Strauss, Professor of Anthropology in the Department of Integrative and Global Studies at the Global School. And we want to continue the very um, engaging conversation that we had uh, with Dean Scheller, with Maria Belen Power, with Franco Montalto and Doug Parsons in the first part. And now we want to welcome seven student and faculty research teams to present their work, which covers a wide range of locations. It covers the elements of water, air, earth, and fire and also locations from Albania to Worcester, from Mozambique to Melbourne. So this is gonna be a pretty fast paced panel. Each of the presentations will be about five minutes long and I will be introducing each of the presenters or each of the talks rather uh, with the presenters and they will be coming up to the podium and then moving on. So those of you in the audience will see out there in Zoomlandia, we'll see some, some movement as we go. Um, and then know that we will be holding a Q&A at the end of the session. And that Q&A, um, again, as we did before, can be put into the Q&A um, on Zoom there. And we will be following those questions with a return to Dean Scheller and a wrap up for the conversation. Uh, so thank you for... Um, being here with us and for continuing this important conversation. So our very first talk today will be um, Rosalind Bates, Samantha Marshall, and David Short speaking on the evaluation of greenhouse gas emissions in Eilat, Israel. So thank you. Oh, next slide, oh, next yeah, next slide, slide. please. <laughs> Hello, so um, we're going to be focusing on Israel. Um, Israel is particularly vulnerable to regional climate change because of its location. Um, Eilat is on the southernmost tip of Israel, and it's particularly vulnerable, and it's affecting um, the agriculture there very negatively. And the heat waves um, present are becoming more frequent as well as more intense. This is having a devastating impact on Eilat's economy as tourism is beginning to decline and the coral reefs are really suffering there. Local governors, um, government in Eilat has decided to join a membership with the um, Global Covenant of Mayors. And their main goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate the effects of climate change through putting in um, specific goals. Next slide, please. So uh, the first um, thing you do before you propose measures is you want to uh, evaluate and investigate the uh, emissions contributions from different uh, sources in the city. So the main uh, contributors we investigated were electric power, transportation, and waste. Uh, for electric power, we looked at the energy demand um, of the city throughout the entire year of 2019. Uh, as we also um, looked at the regional supply from photovoltaics, as well as solar panels installed on the roofs of uh, homes and buildings in the city. And from that, you can uh, get an estimate of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, due to electric power consumption by city residents. Um, for transportation, uh, we looked at the annual distance traveled by uh, vehicles registered in the city as tracked by the Israeli Ministry of Transportation. And uh, by uh, determining the fuel consumption of those vehicles as, and their um, corresponding emissions, you can 
get an emissions profile for transportation. Um, lastly, for waste, uh, we were able to collect data on the composition and quantity of waste delivered to the uh, landfill in a lot. And by modeling the decomposition of waste uh, over time and uh, extrapolating the uh, methane and carbon dioxide released from the uh, decomposition of waste, uh, as well as factoring the methane recovery program that the city has implemented. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I see one slide. Yeah, I'm back. Oh, okay. So I, I think we're missing a slide here. Oh, that's okay. So basically what we were gonna talk about are um, the emission, um, programs that are planned, um, that are already taking place, and that are, um, sorry, uh, being like pro in process right now. So one of the main things um, in ILOT that is already happening and is actually national is that um, there's a requirement for residential buildings to have um, solar water heaters. Um, and one of the plans, main plans, um, ways to reduce their emissions is um, to increase the installation of solar panels um, on the rooftops in the city. And finally, planning looking forward based on our analysis um, through this project, we felt that a recycling or composting would be of particular value for this, um, for ILOT because um, we noticed that in the waste emissions, a large component of their, uh, like the composition of the waste in the landfills was actually cardboard. So, um, and followed by like food and paper. So moving forward, those would be some great steps. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and now we have mitigating just, sorry, mitigating extreme heat risks in cities, a justice center approach to climate resilience planning. And for this, we have Professor Steve McCauley in the Department of Integrative and Global Studies, DIGS, um, and he will be talking about his work in Melbourne, Australia. Worcester. And Worcester, sorry, in Worcester and Melbourne. Yeah. Hi, thank you. It's an honor to be here as part of this um, part of this session. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some uh, justice-centered climate resilience planning, mostly actually in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I'll tell you about some links to Melbourne, Australia. So it won't be a surprise to any of you after this last summer that this year was a record-setting year for heat. Um, this last June was the hottest June on record in North America and in Africa, as well as here in Massachusetts, and we had deadly heat waves in the Pacific Northwest. Um, something that a couple of facts that the, these heat waves um, remind us of. One is that cities are uniquely exposed to extreme heat risks for a number of reasons. One, the urban heat island effect that traps heat in dense urban areas, and the fact that more people are living in cities, so that 83% of the population in the U.S. now lives in cities. And the concentration of vulnerable infrastructures and economic assets in cities make these important um, places so we know that uh, cities around the world, oh, the other key fact that, that this brings up is to remind us that it's not only cities in the hot tropics that are especially vulnerable, but it's cities in temperate areas as well. So we had really deadly heat waves in, in Chicago in 1995 and Paris in 2003, and now this past year in Portland and Vancouver. So um, we know that cities around the world will be addressing the extreme heat risk as a climate planning priority for the next several decades. Um, the map in the lower left shows a network of cities that are part of NOAA's Heat Watch program that mobilizes citizen scientists to map extreme heat risks in cities. And the map on the right shows the outcome of our citizen science campaign here in the city of Worcester. And that demonstrated that dense urban parts of the city can be as much as 14 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than neighborhoods on the outskirts of the city at the same time. Next slide, please. So we know that extreme heat in cities is an increasing uh, climate concern. Um, but in order to really contribute to climate adaptation planning in cities, 
we need to get beneath what our collaborator at Portland State Vivek Shandas calls the monolith of urban heat islands. We have the data and tools now to understand the distribution of extreme heat and heat risks in cities at a much finer level of detail and to really understand the neighborhood effects of how heat is affecting people and, and the built environment. So um, uh, I, guess, I guess I'll point out um, one thing that we're learning is that heat risks can vary over very small areas by quite a lot actually, even down to the building level and the street level. And this is what's really important to guiding adaptation planning like street trees or cooling uh, parks, splash parks, cooling stations, things like that. Um, the image on the, that you see here on the left shows uh, estimated evening temperatures in the city, part of the city of Worcester um, by building. And this allows us to start asking questions about the physical nature of heat in neighborhoods. So that how does the texture of the built environment, for example, affect heat, or how does the aspect of the neighborhood to the sun affect the experience of heat in those neighborhoods? And we also know that the social vulnerabilities to risk also vary across neighborhoods and in quite close areas. The map on the right shows our model of the social vulnerability to heat that we've done for the city of Worcester. And you can see in the top part of the map in the north is actually the campus of of WPI, which rates quite lowly on our heat vulnerability index, and then neighborhoods quite nearby actually rank much higher on this heat vulnerability index. Um, so, um, so we have the data and tools to to look closely at these things, and as we try to um, do these analyses and make contributions to city planning about how to do climate adaptation interventions, we want to make sure that because these are the results are showing that the communities that are actually most at risk uh, for extreme heat um, outcomes are those same neighborhoods that have been historically marginalized from decision-making in the city. And so as we go about this kind of analysis and sharing these data with the city, we wanna make sure that our processes don't reproduce those same structural inequalities that have kept some neighborhoods out of decision-making. So the way that we're going about that is one, to sort of highlight these findings that we're finding. And then on the next slide, if you can go to the next slide, I'll show you just briefly our scheme for how we're going about trying to build a um, justice-centered climate resilience to extreme heat in Worcester. So the, the center point of it in the brown box on the left is the city's open data portal, which is a new portal with, where the city is making data available so that residents and planners and academics can really understand what's happening in the city and contribute to to resilience planning and other city goals. So we're working with the city to try to put some of these heat risk mapping analyses up on this open data portal to make them available to folks. But as we do that, we wanna make sure that we build the resident stories into these analyses. So we've proposed this Urban Design Summer Institute that will train some resilience leaders in the city who then can go out and collect a lot of stories from residents about things like, how does extreme heat actually cascade through their lives in specific ways when there is a heat risk? What do people feel about the way that their own neighborhoods are being represented in this kind of data? And how and whether would they use these kind of tools for their own decision making? So we got to fold those kind of stories into the very way we collect data and then analyze data and visualize the data and share it. So that's our goal for here in Worcester. And this sort of framework comes very much out of our frameworks in the Global Projects Program, where we're trying to bring together lots of different kinds of stakeholders at different kinds of, from different sectors in the city to work together toward a goal. And we're starting to propose the same kind of work in Melbourne, where we're just starting to do, to propose the uh, citizen science heat mapping campaign and probably will lead to some of these same kind of interventions. So uh, thanks for that. All right, and now we are welcoming Chase Godino and we have Amelia and Trisha Worthington, um, and they have other partners. This has been an ongoing MQP project, Preparing for the Rise, a study of Boston sea level and designs for coastal resiliency. And you guys are all in civil and environmental engineering, correct? Uh, for your MQP. So welcome you guys to come forward. Thank you.
So to provide a little bit of background for our project, we worked with Stantec to assess how an additional foot of sea level rise, which we'll also refer to as SLR, SLR throughout this presentation, would impact the city of Boston during a 1% annual chance flooding event. So the predictions that we first used to base our stuff on um, was from Climate Ready Boston, uh, which is an initiative done by the city of Boston to assess the impact of uh, climate change. And the first thing we did was we took their 2070, 36 inch um, sea level rise uh, flood layer for a 1% annual chance storm. And then when we looked at new predictions, we found that that was off by about a foot. So we, um, we noticed that that flood layer followed that 13 foot contour. So to bring it up to that, to an additional foot, we brought it to the 14 foot contour to represent that sea level rise scenario. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, once we had mapped all of Boston, we wanted to zone it down just to one area. And we did that by choosing an area that would be heavily impacted by flooding and was uh, high risk based, based on the CDC's uh, social vulnerability index. And from our analysis, we found that East Boston would be a good candidate. So that's what we chose to focus on for the remainder of our project. Next slide. Um, so here you can see, uh, this is zoomed into East Boston, and you can see that we use the GIS map um, to create a depth grid. So this shows us exactly how much flooding will be in each area of East Boston. The dark blue is the deepest flooding, and then the as you get lighter into green, it's more shallow flooding. Um, but this enabled us to um, see what was going to be flooded with the additional sea level rise prediction. Um, and then calculate what this might cost the city of Boston. So if you click to the next slide. So here we did a lot of cost analysis for what it might cost the city of Boston. Um, originally, when Climate Ready Boston did their analysis, they planned on 36 inches of sea level rise by 2070, and they estimated it would cost the city about $1.26 billion. With the additional foot of sea level rise, we estimated that it would cost the city about $1.6 billion. Um, and then we found that an additional 500 buildings would be affected with just in East Boston. So that's commercial buildings um, and residential buildings. And it will cost about $220,000 more for residents because um, there will be that much more additional flooding within the neighborhood. Next slide. So within East Boston, we identified our area of focus based off of the projects that CRB Climate Ready Boston had planned. And in this area along Condor Street, CRB had no planned mitigation projects. So within our area of focus, we identified our three major flood pathways, which are shown on the screen. And for those three major flood pathways, we came up with a design recommendation. So for our designs, we, com we completed an alternatives analysis to see how different designs would work, what were the best options. And from there, we, we narrowed down to three designs for the three different locations. Next slide. So for location one, we decided that the best option would be to replace the current um, wall along Condor Street as the current one is crumbling. Um, it's along, going along the beach and along the street and to add additional shoreline protection like these native grasses. This would prevent any future erosion and really make the structure stronger. Next slide. So for location two and three, we decided that the best option would be a deployable flood wall. So for location two and three, this is right along the urban wild center um, entrances and a deployable flood wall would still allow people to access the park. And um, along with the deployable flood wall, two retention walls on either side should be built to prevent any um, additional leakage. And with the two deployable flood walls, we saw this as a great opportunity for the city to partner up with the community members. 
There are a good amount of businesses in that area right across from the location. So we saw that the city could reach out to those businesses and see if they'd be willing to store the walls and then put them up in the chance of a storm. You can click the next slide. Um, so I think we learned a lot uh, from this project. We only, you know, full-time worked on it for seven weeks, but I think some of our biggest takeaways were climate change is coming in a lot of ways, climate change is now, and mitigation protection is going to have to involve the communities that climate change will affect the most. So thank you. All right, thank you. And now we are moving on to faculty member in uh, fire protection engineering, Professor James Urban, and he's gonna talk to us about, whoops, that it's become part of me these days. I forget it's there. Community climate adaptation in wildfire prone areas. Are we adapting? So Professor Urban, thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we could hold, go back on the previous slide, and it looks like the template got totally changed, which is going to kind of throw a wrench in some things, but I'll see what I can do. So um, if you look at this overhead view of a fire, you can see that there's a lot of trees that are unburned, and there are also some trees that have been burned. And then if you look, you see there's some grayish blobs that are sort of in rectangular shapes, and those are buildings. And one thing that you might see is that, you know, there's some of the trees are still around, but none of these buildings are. And so those trees have adapted to climate change through evolution, whereas, you know, these structures at least haven't. And so that, you know, the question that I'm sort of posing is, you know, are we adapting to climate change? Because as far as I can tell, we aren't really doing a good job, but we've done some things well. And I'll talk about some of the things we're doing here at WPI. So next slide. All right, so uh, normally this had a black background. Um, but the left graph shows the number of fires versus the year. And so the leftmost point is about 1980, the rightmost point is 2020. And you can see that the number of fires is approximately constant. And then on the right, the size of the fires um, for each year um, shows there's a clear trend where there's, they're increasing. Um, and this is for the United States, so not every place is the same. For instance, in California, there's actually less fires. And you may think to yourself, this is really weird. You know, there's all these fires in the news, climate change is causing more fires, you know, we're all going to burn alive. Um, but that's actually, it's not the case. Climate change is making fires bigger. And that's a key difference. Also, at the same time, there are more people moving into wildland areas. And we have what's called the wildland urban interface, or WUI. And so if you can say Worcester, you can say WUI, it's not that strange. But, um, but basically, you can see in this image, you know, people are built, uh, they built up homes right next to a forest. And you can see all their manicured lawns, those trees are nice and green. The forest isn't. And so really that poses a big fire risk. Um, and so it's important to think about this because you may hear in the news that climate change is the cause of all the fire danger. And it's not all of it, it's definitely a huge player, but there's a lot of things where humans are making choices that are affecting our exposure to fire and then also the, um, the intensity of the fires. And so one thing I didn't show here, which is, uh, wildfire management, because it's kind of a hard thing to show the, um, you know, a bad example, or, you know, what I would say is the ideal. And um, right now, or historically speaking in the United States, our approach has been to put out a wildfire as quickly as possible. And, you know, the idea is to save people's property, to save the, the forests. Um, but actually a lot of these fires, or a lot of the, um, the wildland areas in say the Western United States have evolved to have burning happen on a regular basis. Um, and what actually happens is when you suppress these fires, you create a huge load of unburned fuel. And then when a fire does happen, it's much more severe. It burns the trees completely and kills them, um, and then also can move into urban areas and cause a lot of harm. And so it's very tricky when you think about um, what are the ways in which um, fire is a problem. If you go to the next slide. And so if you say, you know, are we adapting, um, you know, throwing here a couple of examples of cases of, of, I would say, reactions, some of which are adaptations and some of which aren't. Um, you know, I think there's been some successes. One of them is community education. There's been a lot of uh, education of how to implement uh, research. So, you know, how do we, how do you make a home safe? And most of that involves clearing the immediate area of combustible material, and then also um, doing thinning it further out 
and so on and so on. And this builds on uh, fire protection standards and policies such as NFPA 1140, which uh, myself and Professor Simeone have contributed to that. Um, but this is actually a very new thing. We've, this isn't even uh, officially out yet. It comes out in 2022 uh, and it's the first edition. Uh, there's also been fire resistant materials and shown here in the bottom right, you can see that there's one home that it's on fire and the other one isn't. And that's because it used fire uh, resistant materials and construction. Um, but a problem still exists is, you know, are people gonna adopt these materials? Um, companies have developed these materials so they can sell them and they aren't charities. Um, and so these can often cost money and people uh, wanna save their money. And so then the center bottom image is an image of Santa Rosa, which was burnt during the Tubbs fire in 2017. And you can see on the left, it's pretty much very shortly after the, after the fire. And you can see that there's basically no home standing. There's a couple that are actually still standing and some are being rebuilt. But then you look a year after that approximately and nearly all the homes are rebuilt and they're still just as close together. And it's unclear if they have um, adopted fire resistant uh, materials and construction practices. You know, one thing that I see immediately, if you look at the, the image above, you see those big zones around the house. You don't see those here. Um, and so you, know, you can ask yourself, are we, um, how is this gonna turn out when the next fire happens? And then also in the bottom left, you know, one of the ways California has responded to the need to suppress wildfires is hiring inmate firefighters and paying them two to $5 a day, depending on whether they're actually responding to a fire. And I think, you know, this is maybe a way to bolster the, the forces, but it, it raises serious eth ethical questions about how effective this is. Um, and then finally, there's also people who are taking the matters into their own hands. There's a really great NPR, or sorry, New York Times article um, that was also recently featured on the Daily. And I have a picture shown here where they talk about a family's um, choice to stay behind when they were told to evacuate and defend their farm. Um, and so this in some ways seems like a good, you know, a heroic story, but it's also potentially they're putting first responders in jeopardy because they may be called in to respond and have to make a choice of whether to risk their lives to defend them. And so I think there's definitely room for, uh, for doing more. Uh, next slide. And so I think, you know, there's been some successes and there's also been, you know, there's definitely some challenges. And I think one of the biggest issues is we have, we have a lot of technology that can solve a lot of these problems, but the problem is people don't necessarily want to adopt them. You know, I wouldn't want to be the one telling those people in Santa Rosa not to rebuild. Um, and so I think one thing that the engineering community needs to do, and I guess more broadly, everybody needs to do, is we need to find ways, you know, fixes, so to speak, that meet people where they are and that they'll actually use. Um, and at WPI, I'm very excited because we're, we are doing a lot, I think, to address that. We've got multiple wildfire MPPs just this, uh, this year, I guess, because multiple terms. We have uh, two going on that I'm overseeing. One group is making a wildfire fighting ro uh, robot. And then also we've got one that's uh, investigating fire brands, which are a main, major way in which wildfires spread. And then we also have various uh, projects that graduate students are working on, including fundamental fire, uh, wildfire research, and looking at how will we fire spread from building to building, and then also um, developing technology uh, to detect and prevent these fires. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And so now we're gonna move on to two other faculty members. So we have Leslie Dodson, who is in the Global Lab and Bob Hirsch, who is in also in the Diggs, Leslie is also in Diggs and the Global School. And they're gonna be talking to us about climate games, connected learning, connected research. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Mimi, for giving us this opportunity. And and I wanna thank Bob Hirsch for being an amazing collaborator and colleague in our ongoing adventure of climate games, connected learning and connected research. Uh, next slide, please. So climate games, what are climate games? Climate games are purpose-driven, playful environments. They encourage better decision-making in light of climate risks and responses. So climate games, they are immersive, facilitated, analog, experiential, embodied, and they're applicable to a full range of stakeholders. And I do wanna to point, to point out the Red Cross Red, Red Crescent Climate Center is a leader in developing climate games. And they have helped us understand how climate games inform evidence-based decision-making by linking evidence and emotion or logos and pathos 
to increase the willingness to respond and act to climate pressures. And in these innovative and um, communication and action tools, what you have is players inhabit realities of climate risk management, and then they can test plausible futures in a very playful way. And these climate games support communities to analyze the causes and effects of climate change, to integrate scientific and community knowledge, and then to plan adaptation and resilience efforts. Importantly, subtly, but importantly, when games are played in a multi-stakeholder context, these games can flatten hierarchies. And that opens the way to better decision-making and collaborative action. And games also are research tools in that they provide researchers, and that may be students, faculty, practitioner researchers, the opportunity to study community understanding of issues, of evidence, and of resilience measures. And I'll turn now to Bob Hirsch, who will talk about climate games in action, and in particular in action in Albania. Well, thanks, Leslie. I, I would need more than five minutes to expound the virtues of Leslie as a colleague. I, perhaps I could take them, but I suppose I shouldn't. But uh, uh, thank you, Sarah and Mimi, for inviting us for this talk and for the, the people in the audience and the people in Zoom. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we adapted climate change games in Albania um, and to talk a little bit about connected learning. So connected learning, as far as thinking about this was, how do you design through the IQP, the inter, the, which is a fundamental um, project that our students do in the third year, how do you connect the expertise and interest of the faculty advisors, in this case would be questions around climate change adaptation, uh, risk uh, theories, um, with a willing sponsor who has the capability to turn that project into an extraordinary experience for students um, that can take them in, in directions that they hadn't imagined beforehand. So the uh, next slide would be good, thanks. Um, so this project, I'll, I'll try to keep my, keep my talk to about three minutes or so, but this is based on a, an IQP project in 2017 that Leslie and I advised in Albania. And the project was called Flood Risk um, reducing flood risk in Skoda, which is a city in Northern Albania through, and this is the key thing, community engagement. Community engagement and environmental decision-making in Albania is just not on the cards. It hasn't been for the 50 years of the communist regime and it hasn't been part of any deliberation around decision-making around climate change or other things um, in the 20 years after the fall of communism. And so, the project was was motivated by flooding in 2010 in northern in northern Albanian Skoda. It was the worst flood in living memory. 15,000 acres were underwater, some for more than two months. 16,000 people were displaced. Tens of thousands of animals, rural farm animals, um, were drowned. Um, the defenses that had protected the area beforehand, hydroelectric hydroelectric dams could not hold back the water. They had to spill the water to, to maintain the integrity of the dam. The channels and drainage ditches that the communist regime had built in 1963 were no longer being maintained. That was the sort of hydrological basis of the project. The social terrain is even more interesting. The students to develop the project games had to work with people who were flood victims who had illegally set up homes on this land after the fall of communism. Um, they, were, they were from the northern part of Albania, from mountainous areas. They had escaped 50 years of collectivization. They wanted their own property. They weren't leaving. They hadn't been aware of the flood risk as much as perhaps the earlier residents. Um, the other group that the students were working with was a socially excluded group. That's the Roma community, um, which is a large group in Albania. They have been socially excluded for decades and decades. Um, our sponsor, GI, a German group called GIZ Development Agency, had developed a very comprehensive flood risk management plan, but they had the sort of the last mile problem. How can they take the plan and incorporate 
the views of local residents who, one, mistrusted the government, had no tradition of participation in environmental decision making, and um, felt that their voices would never be heard and it would make no point. So the students felt, how can we engage communities? And we worked with students from the university in Skodra who were social workers, and many of them were from families from the area. And so to provide access to the people we worked with, the students would, or our Albanian co-researcher students would take our students to villages and they would interview people and talk with people about their experiences during the floods, about their lasting repercussions, about what they could have done, what they had done. And using all this information, the students developed something called, um, a game called Before, Before the Flood. As you can see on, uh, up here, this, that was the Ill Illyrian village of the Roma community that was flooded for about um, a month. People couldn't cross that bridge, it was underwater. And so the, the game, as, as Leslie was saying, tries to help people imagine the actions that they could take. And so it looks at four different uh, forecasts and four different strategies that communities could take and residents can take. One, what happens, what would you do a month in advance? What would you do five days in advance? What would you do a day in advance? What would you do five minutes in advance, which, which was what many people experienced in 2010. So that's the scenario. And then what students would do based on their interviews, they would, they would develop activity cards ranging from structural considerations. We would clean, we would clean the, um, we would clean the, clean the various drainage canals. We would untether our cows. We would cut off our electricity. And what happened is each group would have these activity cards and they would be able to say, this is, this is what we're doing. This is how we would deal with these floods. And as Leslie was saying, it, for groups that felt excluded, this gave them opportunities to discuss strategies, the resources they could call on, the state. And I'm delighted to say that the students ended this with um, having them fill out a, a personal plan that this is what we we'll do during the flood, this is the kit we'll take. And they, the students were so brilliant. They, they laminated this, put it in an envelope and had people put it on their doors so they could see this in the flood. Um, this game was used by GIS consequently in multiple iterations of community outreach. It's being used across Albania and in other places that GIZ is working. Sorry for going over time, but this is it's an exciting and powerful story I wanted to share with you. I'll turn this back to Thank you. I'll, I'll quickly finish if you could advance to the next slide. Um, in, to tell you, you've probably never seen the Albanian flag, the Puerto Rico flag, and the South African flag right next to each other. And that is because that represents our, um, our next effort at collective and connected research. So we will be taking two cohorts to Puerto Rico, to San Juan to work in communities, Piñones, with an organization Para la Naturaleza in Kuboy, in order to work on um, resilience planning. And that could be everything from emergency planning, sustainable livelihoods, uh, and other ever-increasing vulnerabilities related to climate. So there will be games. Um, additionally, on the transmedia action research, I wanna just briefly touch on this scholarship. This is a, a chapter I submitted recently that I, where I posit transmedia action research as a new construct for community engagement and research. And this fuses participatory action research, participatory learning and action and transmedia storytelling. And transmedia storytelling is in this context is participatory co-production of multidimensional and multimedia experiences and also that, few, that also incorporates formal and informal knowledge in social action story worlds. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Ah, thank you very much. So many cool things going on. Uh, so now we want to return to a student group, an MQP team, Peyton Bielowski and uh, Anna, Anna Korea. Um, who are going to talk to us about collaborative sustainable campus development for architectural engineering MQP uh, in Mozambique. So thank you.
Thank you. Next slide. Um, our project was to create designs for a university to be built on a plot of land along Mozambique's southern coast. The site is just north of the nation's capital, Maputo, as you can see here on the map. When we first started our project, we were asked to design a new university campus in this region, but we were immediately met with challenges of designing for a location and culture we knew nothing about. So we started off by talking to local leaders and proponents of the project to gain better understanding of the community's needs and limitations. They wanted a campus that could bring a global community together and they wanted to emphasize sustainable design and protection of the local ecosystem. We also had to account for the fact that Makaneda Beach is prone to cyclones and may face increasing natural disasters in the coming years. Furthermore, there were no paved roads to access the site and materials available in Mozambique are different than in the US. So before even starting to attempt designs for the campus, we had to heavily research and analyze the site for environmental elements, including climate, flooding, and risk of natural disaster, as well as access and available resources. One example of this is the diagram to the right showing initial site analysis for sea level rise and flooding. This allowed us to determine that our site isn't likely to flood from sea level rise in the foreseeable future, but the nearby area in blue is of concern. Analyses such as these were essential to the design of our sustainable campus because we had to take local considerations and climate change projections into account, especially because Makaneda is a vulnerable community. Next slide. So then combining all of this initial research, we created two building designs for the initial campus using cargo shipping containers. And we determined shipping containers to be a sustainable option for the initial development of the campus because shipping container construction offers a more sustainable and affordable alternative to current construction practices in Mozambique. Shipping containers are plentiful in Maputo, which you saw before is just south of our site. Um, so repurposing them will draw from local resources and decrease waste. And shipping containers also offer many benefits, including their structural strength, increased speed of construction when they're used as modular building components, and relatively low cost compared to other building materials. The top image here shows an initial administration building for students and faculty. It would provide gathering spaces, offices, and an initial classroom, which you can see in renderings on the right. The bottom image shows an initial housing complex, which would be necessary for the first phase of the campus because the site is remote um, and currently lacks infrastructure to make daily transportation to and from the site feasible. So this complex can house 100 people with bathroom facilities and communal spaces on each floor, and it can be built in sections or expanded upon in the future as the campus develops further. Next slide, please. And so finally, a main focus of our design for the campus was sustainability, not only because this was an initial goal of project stakeholders, but also because designing buildings that will merge with and help protect the local ecosystem will also allow the campus to remain environmentally adaptive throughout its life cycle. So this diagram here shows some of the key features at the building level for our administration building design including outdoor collaborative spaces that will minimize the need for indoor climate control in the building, uh, recycled and locally sourced materials for walkways and building elements, rainwater collection and management on the roofs of the building, renewable energy from solar panels, and walkability to reduce the need for vehicles and pollution on site. When used simultaneously, these strategies will achieve the sustainability goals at the campus put in place by Mozambique in leaders and project proponents. And it'll also provide greater access to knowledge of sustainable design practices for the local community, which will jumpstart their efforts to find sustainable practices that work best for them. Thank you very much for listening. All right, and last but not least, we return to faculty. Uh, Professor Paul Matheson, who is the Director of the Office of Sustainability at WPI, as well as an Associate Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering. And he's going to talk to us, uh, returning to the region, about watershed scale adaptation managing urban water infrastructure, I think, primarily in Boston. Yeah? Oh, or Worcester. Okay. Right, right to home. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sarah. Okay, I'd like to spend the next uh, few minutes talking about some of the initiatives here we have here at WPI regarding uh, urban infrastructure, uh, particularly with a focus on water and, uh, and stormwater in particular. Um, the, um, the management of stormwater in urban areas has become extremely uh, difficult recently in particular due to increases in extreme events, as well as um, well associated with uh, climate change, particularly with the increases in the, or higher frequency of high events, as well as uh, increases in magnitude of these events. Um, in general, stormwater management has been challenging in these areas, really because there, there's increases or high populations. Um, in association with that, there's also uh, an impervious area in the ground cover. There's increased stormwater runoff, and, uh, and as a result, you see lots of flooding in the areas. Um, as you can see here for uh, Worcester as an example, shown on the right side of the side, sleep side. And uh, these result in a decrease in water uh, quality and have a real impact on the local communities, which is a real concern. So really there's a need to manage our stormwater to protect uh, public health as well as the environment. Um, if you look at the slide uh, in the, or the middle of the slide, the figure there shows Massachusetts with the uh, outlines of our watersheds or sub drainage areas in Massachusetts. I'm picking on two in particular. One is the Blackstone River watershed, which is located in central Massachusetts by Worcester. Uh, there's another one, which is the Mystic River watershed, um, which uh, at this point, and I'm bringing that up in part because I want to do a shout out to my colleague, uh, uh, Seth Tuller, who does uh, excellent work looking at the, uh, in collaboration with the Resilient Mystic uh, uh, Collaborative. And uh, his work there really looks at different communities and how to engage those communities and the need for engagement and collaboration to address uh, problems involving climate change at a watershed scale. For my purpose, I want to spend some time just talking at the upper end of the watershed in the uh, Blackstone River watershed, uh, which is uh, the uh, um, city of Worcester. You can kind of barely see the outline right at the top of the watershed there. You can go to the next slide. We'll follow along with that. Okay, um, and if again, the red bright red line at the top shows the top of the uh, Worcester, you see the outline. Um, and um, to get a sense for how to address the problem, you need to have a little bit of an idea of the characteristics of the, uh, the water and the system in Worcester. And uh, this figure here just shows you generally the center figure. If you will go to the middle portion of the slide, um, right where the, uh, right by the, the lake up there, there, there you go, perfect in location. Um, that's basically Salisbury Pond right by WPI. And this is where the water from the city of Worcester, basically uh, there's a, um, streams that go underground basically work their way down towards the Blackstone River, which is at, down at the bottom of the slide. In addition, at the bottom of the slide, there's also a wastewater treatment plant, um, which is uh, basically handles a lot of the wastewater. On the upper left-hand side of the slide is actually the water supply for Worcester, which provides all the water for Worcester, which actually ends up as a result of people consuming, ends up in the, west, the wastewater treatment plant as well. So, if we go to the right-hand side of the slide, this gives you an indication in general, it's kind of a messy figure, but hopefully it'll give you some ideas of the nature of the water. In dry weather conditions, the water flows through the blue line down through the stream down towards the uh, Blackstone River. Okay? Um, we also have wastewater being collected in that time, which ends up at the wastewater treatment plant. So those are the final outflows of where the water is going to end up. In Worcester, you know, which is typical of many urban communities and in, in, in from the industrial area in, in New England and other areas, um, the, and this focuses primarily um, on the central area, becomes a real concern, um, which is shown there in orange in the, the map there. Um, we basically have stormwater and wastewater flowing into the same pipes, such that you get really high flow conditions uh, and with poor quality going into the same pipes, which discharge actually, and for the case of Worcester, into that red line, which is a overall, what they call a combined sewer collective, collects all the uh, stormwater as well as the wastewater. That water is actually pumped down towards the wastewater treatment facility to the extent that it, that can be done. If it can't be managed because there's so much water, this is going to be discharged in the environment. If there's capacity or limitations in the lines in the pipe system, these are going to flood in those areas, and that's a big concern for the city of Worcester. So we have stormwater that's providing flooding, and then we also have this combined sewage, which really has impacts on the local communities. Um, the process that we went through to analyze this stuff, to come up with an adaptation plans essentially to try to evaluate this, includes really developing models, um, trying to assess climate change and the, uh, the downscaling, the models associated with climate change to come up with design storms um, and uh, really identifying metrics. I don't want to go into great detail on it, but it'll give you an idea of it. And then identifying options 
to help mitigate some of the problems associated with Worcester. What's interesting is I think the previous presentations that we've seen before really talk about, you know, we can identify these options, but you really got to think about the local community as well. You know, here in this case, we have operations management to address, um, to try to think about how we manage the flows and the pumping system, but we have potential for storage, how we can try to store the water to keep it from flooding, how can we maybe separate, try to separate the sewers, voice water from the stormwater, and then finally use of green infrastructure, which gives you options to really get the community involved and actually try to support the local community and, and recognize some of the impacts of these things. We really need to assess the impacts on the communities um, as well as address trying to the economics of the system as well. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. So just to give you an idea of some of the results, and I have to say, you know, historically, some of this is workers, Tom Rumeau, a student here, a graduate student, also a collaboration with some folks from uh, Tufts as well, who I've worked with before. Um, but some of the big impacts include, or how you think of impacts would be, how do we, we manage the operations of the facilities and try to provide storage and try to provide green infrastructure as well. Those are the technical solutions also, but really what's important to note is that an integrated approach is really necessary to address these issues. Um, first thing, common approach is to recognize the one water approach. Recognize the, that there's a, an integrated, um, um, the, the nature of water is that well, we have all these different types of water sources going into the same system. We have to try to manage together. Okay, the other thing is we need multiple organizations to be involved. We need to really recognize the inputs from all the people involved in these things and the people who are impacted as well. So for our next steps, we're moving on to an additional project related to this, but this will include, you know, recognizing the new climate information that's become available. How do communities incorporate that? How do you consider the water quality and the social I call it, impacts as well as benefits of these various solutions for the community members and how we can really get them integrated in these projects. It really involves a community and, and a, a watershed perspective to try to address these issues. And that's what's exciting about this uh, added community uh, climate change you know, adaptation program is that we try to think about both the, you know, from the engineering end, but as well as the uh, perspective of community members. And then if we go back um, to you know, think about these issues on a watershed scale, try to look at the integrated, how people can work together to come up with these solutions. Um, it's really, a, well, it's an important issue to address. Um, and I think these issues are relevant locally as well as globally. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Next slide. Wonderful. Thank you so much all out there in Zoomlandia for listening and for all of our wonderful presentations that give you just a taste of what our students and faculty have been doing. And now I'm gonna turn the podium back over to Dean Minuscheller who will lead a Q and A and kind of wrap up our really exciting afternoon of thinking about what we all can do collaboratively at home and abroad. Thank you everybody. And thank you, um, Sarah, especially for organizing all of our panelists today and for all of our panelists for being here. Um, and for those of you who are still in our Zoom audience, I invite you to add questions to the chat. We will be happy to answer anything you have um, about the specific projects or about the wider um, discussion that we have. And let's see, the best way to do that is to type your question into the chat and then I will ask it out loud. And while we're waiting for questions to arrive, I have some questions for all of you. And one, one of the things that come out is we, we've heard about fires, we've heard about flooding, we've heard about stormwater management, we've you know, heard about all different kinds of risks. And one question in my mind as I was listening is, are there sometimes conflicting adaptations that are needed at the same time and and we can't do all of it so what happens when you you know you you want to adapt to say fire we heard by removing some of the vegetation and spreading out right the the land use around buildings to make clear areas but on the other hand we we don't want to take up all the land right and we don't want to deforest all the land so like, what, I'm just thinking, can anyone comment on the trade-offs between 
how do we deal with flooding versus how do we deal with fires versus how do we deal with um, mitigating our carbon um, emissions like we heard in the in the first talk and what do you see as are there trade-offs or are there like win-win situations where the things we do can help address multiple risks or hazards at once does anyone um, if you if any of the groups have a thought on that please come on up and address our audience directly thank you yeah, so I thought about this um, when you talked about spreading out houses and having more room around them. And it, I'm, it's interesting that that is a good practice for fire mitigation because you hear so much about like high density housing in urban areas and how they can be um, like a lot more efficient to have more people living together and that kind of thing. And that was really interesting. But I think during like specifically about flooding, um, during our project, we looked at other areas too, and like just to see what their sea level rise projections were, like places like Miami. And I think at some point, it's an unpopular ish opinion, <laughs> but at some point, I think we just need to take a hard look at like where humans can and cannot live. You know, like it's really cool to live in Miami, the beach is great, and things like that. It's really cool to have all these really big, like coastal urban areas. But at some point, I think we're just gonna have to take a hard look about whether or not we're supposed to live there. Great. Okay, and here we have a, a great question from our audience, which is how early in their studies can students get involved in work or projects around climate change adaptation? How do you see us building student interest from the first year they're on campus? And um, maybe one of our faculty wants to speak to that in the ways in which students go from the Great Problem Seminar into planning their uh, IQP projects and maybe then doing a master's qualifying, a major qualifying project as a senior. Okay, here's one of our faculty members. Hi, thanks again. I'm Stephen McCauley, a faculty in the Department of Integrative and Global Studies. Um, students uh, get involved, uh, can get involved in their first year in our project-based learning programs, which expose them uh, in really direct ways to addressing grand challenges uh, in the world, whether that's around uh, energy needs or water or health or education. That's through what we call the Great Problem Seminar, which is an optional program that students can participate in in their first year. And it really does um, uh, expose them and bring them uh, to face-to-face -face with um, these really complex issues, both from the sort of climate impact side to the complex uh, social realities that any kind of potential solutions might come in. And then they can sort of build through their academic um, career here at WPI through other project-based learning experiences, such as the IQP, which is their third year project that immerses them more deeply in these kind of challenges. Uh, and even in their MQPs, their major qualifying projects, um, particularly through majors like civil engineering or others that can really help work on these solutions. So um, the students can get involved pretty early on in this stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And I'm going to take the next one from Alejandro Manga uh, uh, about whether or not we have thought about making social justice principles an integral part of our projects at WPI from inception in metrics or otherwise. And I will say that, yes, in fact, social justice is a part of all of the things we do with project based learning at WPI from these first year projects that Steve has just been talking about through the IQP, the Interactive Qualifying Project for our juniors is required, um, and also through our senior level, what we would think of as senior theses in other places, our MQPs. Um, and these also now are being included in our new program in community climate adaptation. Um, and across the board, we are starting to, first of all, integrate sustainable development goals, which include these kinds of social justice and environmental justice equity issues, as well as um, including those components. So for example, for the IQP, there are learning outcomes that specifically address this and also for the first year projects. So we have that built in from the ground up with our social science, humanities, uh, communications, et cetera, faculty working with our engineering and science faculty on these, on these issues. Great, thank you. And um, 
Another kind of question uh, comes from one of our attendees about whether anyone is working on ways to inform people on what each individual can do to minimize his or her or their impact on climate change. What is being done here? And I'll note that that's a question about what sometimes is called carbon mitigation, which is sometimes a separate topic from climate adaptation. And it's a whole complex area of, of thought and discussion of what's the relationship between mitigating our impact, especially those of us in the global north, who, um, as we heard earlier today from Maria Belen Power, we have uh, a big impact in terms of our energy consumption, and as well as those who are more well off, who are from wealthier communities also tend to have a bigger impact in terms of carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so it's a question of relations between who's doing the adapting and who's doing the mitigating carbon. And does anyone have thoughts on that in terms of what communities you're working with? Yeah, one up. I mean, it's not any communities that I work with personally, but I, my understanding too is you can sort of flip the question of what are individuals doing about climate change. You could say, what are organizations doing? And there's a lot of um, marketing that goes towards saying, you know, what are we as individuals doing wrong? But actually, if you look at companies, which are often in uh, countries, have more ability to make change. And I think the better question to ask is, what are they doing? Really good point. And here's one from um, a question really for a student. So we wanna hear more from the students who are here. How worried are you regarding the effects of climate change in your lifetime? And how hopeful are you in finding ways to halt and reverse climate change? That's a really important question. And I would love to hear multiple answers to that um, if, if folks wanna think about that and, and come up and maybe reflect on whether the kind of project work you're doing is helping you feel better <laughs> about the future um, or not. Let us know. Um, so like our project looking at sea level rise, it did not make me feel any better at all. Um, one of the main things, one of the main reasons why was because I knew at the time I'd gotten a job in Rhode Island and I was like, I don't want to buy any land in Rhode Island for a very long time. Just looking at these projections and noticing that most of it will be underwater, at least where I was looking at for a living. Um, and just like, also just glad that I'm done with like in-person school um, as like climate change gets worse, there's definitely gonna be more pandemics and I don't really wanna do more like <laughs> shifting to online and then in-person and then back and forth. So yeah, I'm very worried. <laughs> well, that's gonna add more thoughts to that. Yeah, I think that it can be really stressful if you take a long, hard look at the different challenges we face. But I had Professor Stoddard for a class last year. Um, I do not remember the name of the class, but it was about community climate adaption. Um, and I think she put it really well. She's like, look, like we're gonna talk about a lot of like issues that will probably stress you out, sea level rise, like heat and all that kind of thing. But just remember that like, you're in a room full of other really smart people who care a lot about this. And I think just like, you know, talking to my classmates and stuff like that and talking like professors that care so much and like make it like a basis in their class gave me hope that, you know, at least us here, you know, there are other people that like take it as seriously as I do and think about it like that. So scary, yes, but there's other people that care just as much as we all do. So That's, that was a fantastic answer. Thank you. And I mean, it, it makes me think about how the more we all work on this together, like the more hope there is for the future. And so if we can 
keep working on it, keep communicating it, keep getting other people involved. And we see it at the you know, campus level, the city level, the state, um, and, and changes in federal policy too, making different kinds of funding available for projects is all helping, I think, advance our collective um, efforts at community climate adaptation. And I know, I think um, Professor Strauss wanted to make some comments as well. So, um, and maybe unless we have any more further questions from the audience, we'll maybe round it out with this final commentary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I wanna think about these. I really appreciate the student perspective on these. And I, I hope that one of the things, whether or not your projects made you feel more hopeful, and there's a lot of things that are really hard to deal with, um, that at least they maybe made you feel that there are some tools that you have to apply to other contexts, other problems in other places uh, when you're doing this. And one of the things that if you had been out there in Zoomlandia listening to the whole um, session, the earlier part of this, um, one of the things that really was of, I think we didn't spend enough time on and is maybe really important to highlight that might make us feel a little more hopeful is to think about these synergies, right? So we look at a specific problem to do with fire or to do with sea level rise or water management, whatever those things are. And, and we sometimes forget that a lot of the things that we can do to address climate change um, can be synergistic. That can, they can help on a bunch of fronts at once. And we can be, if we're thinking in a wider systems perspective rather than, of course we want to be, focused on the local and talk to local communities. But as was mentioned, if we put that in a much broader perspective, global, regional, whatever, we start to see ways that the things that we're doing can matter. So if we are shifting from individual people in cars to a public transit system, which then also has us walking, it's both um, a mitigation reduction, it's a reduction of carbon. So it's a mitigation strategy at one level. It's also improving people's health. It's uh, getting them to know their fellow travelers in life in the community. It's building health in a bunch of different ways. So we can see that some of the solutions that we come up with, or the strategies, I should say, um, not to, to have a final, perfect, temporally contained solution, but that we are developing strategies that we are modifying as we go, that are inter interacting with other kinds of solutions for health, for um, addressing sprawl, for example, for reducing water uh, use, as well as addressing climate change in sort of specific ways. Because climate change really, when we come down to it, is in most places, except maybe, you know, if we think about the Arctic and permafrost melting, okay, that's a fairly specific thing. But mostly what climate change is doing to impact our local communities is, making all the problems we already had worse. And we weren't doing really well at solving those problems, addressing those problems as individual things. But when we start to step back and we start to integrate our solutions and our approaches to these problems, using all of these different tools, using local knowledge of how people had survived and made happy, wonderful lives in particular places over time, when we start to integrate all of that knowledge, we start to have ways that are productive to address these challenges. And we find that those systems-wide approaches tend to be more helpful and more invigorating for the, you know, we are social beings, right? So it is that community level of collaboration bringing in all of those kinds of tools that can really help us move forward. So that's my thought on this, but thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. This has been a great discussion. And um, if we can just move on to the next slide, we just want to finish with uh, some acknowledgements because a lot of people have helped us bring this program together today. Um, we want to thank, of course, President Leshen, who introduced the program, Carrie West, who has been behind the scenes advancing the slides and preparing everything for us and doing all the program coordination. So great thanks to Carrie for your incredible support for making this possible. Our Associate Dean Kent Rissmiller and the entire Global School team 
who have supported this work and helped build the global school and get us to the point we're at with this wonderful master's program in community climate adaptation. Thanks to Diane O'Keefe and our marketing team and to today's session organizer, Sarah Strauss, who is the co-director of the Community Climate Adaptation Master's Degree Program. So thank you all, and thank you to all of our participants. Good evening. <laughs> Oh.